Well, hey, good evening and welcome to Fish on Northwest. Dwayne England, Kelly Barnum, and uh, we are back in the studio. It's been a week yeah. already, can you believe it? It's, time flies. Ugh. Time flies. Summertime. So much Summertime going on. Um, yeah, we, uh, we are starting as we did last week, and this will be our normal time now. So if you're joining us, we appreciate that. 7 p.m. right here on YouTube and Facebook, of course. You can watch on either platform. We multicast, and we thank you for tuning in. Uh, we have an extremely busy show this evening. That's Moving nice. around lots, talking about a lot of different fisheries and some things going on throughout the Northwest. As you know, we're going to cover some news information as we uh, get the show up and running here. I uh, want to remind everybody that... Uh, Fish on Northwest is presented by Better Homes and Gardens Pacific Commons Real Estate located in Puyallup, Washington, and we thank them for that. A quick shout out to David over in IT Corner making all this happen. He does a fantastic job. And of course, as we do each and every week, we will be joined later in the kitchen by Chef Kelly Lance O'Neill and his wonderful assistant, Sherry. And I have no idea what they're doing tonight, but I'm sure it's something pretty darn good. Always is. So we'll have to check that out. Um, okay. Uh, hey, you, my friend. Got to get out fishing this yeah, last week. Yeah, I was fishing. Week. I've Actually been busy working, but uh, you went out after some coho. Yeah, Saturday or Sunday morning. Uh, finally got out a little bit, ran out of Westport. Uh, got some reports that they were, there's actually a big ball of fish about 30 to 35 miles north of Westport, right. north, northwest. Right. I uh, said, you know what? I'm not running 30, 35 miles for coho. Just, <laughs> just not doing it. Not going to do. Uh, decided to stay a little bit south, uh, ran, kind of followed the red line and just kind of ran south, southwest. Uh, ran out to like the 168, 170 foot line. Okay. Uh, got a spot out there where I've caught some fish in the past. Yep. Dropped in there, and within a couple minutes, we'd hooked three or four fish and got a hatchery in the box and thought, wow, you know, we're dialed in. And then... Not too shabby. Desert. Seriously? <laughs> yeah. It just shut off. And this was our... I mean, this was all... The whole trip. We leave there. We bump out to like 190, drop in there, uh, hammer a couple fish. I mean, a couple takedowns, yeah. catch a fish, and think, okay, we're back on them. Desert. Now, you're in 190 foot of water. Right. But I'm going to let folks know, uh, you're not a downrigger guy. No, I'm not a downrigger guy. You're, you're guy. fishing lead. I'm fishing lead. Of course lead. you're chasing co. We're so, not going down deep after kings. Right. But, so, uh, so I'm fishing lead the same way that I fish. I fish. So I'm running a 16-ounce dropper cannonball, yeah, yeah. Uh, back to a fish flash, yeah. back to a plug cut herring, yeah. green label. Uh, that's what I fish. I fish 16 ounces of lead. Uh, I fish it for coho. I fish right. it for chinook. I fish it in the rivers. I fish it in the ocean. Yep. I... I and when it comes to speed and presentation, I do everything by line angle. I, I, I know the angle of line that I like to have leaving my rods, yeah. and whether I'm trolling with the current, against the current, yep. or whatever it is, I judge it all by line angle. Yeah, I do too. More times yeah. than not anymore, I found that to be more successful. I'm like, okay, we're going after coho, man, I gotta bump it up to three miles per hour. Yeah. And I get there and my line angle is still a little flat. Right. D depending on what's going on, if I'm, you know, uh, Puget Sound or if I'm, you know, fishing a river and we got a tide change or whatever it is, mm -hmm. and then I always come back to line angle. It's right. Like line so, angle is the key. So, as I don't remember north or south now, but as we would troll one direction, my line angle was perfect at like three and a half miles an hour. Sure. And then we'd change and troll, I believe, south. We go against the current, right. and my line angle would be good at like 1.1 miles right. an hour. But right. I mean, that's just how I judge it. That's the only like thing you have to be cognizant of is obviously your tide, yes, and and your speed of troll and your line angle. And you may, uh, you know, middle of the afternoon, you got up early, you kind of started getting a little tired back there on the tiller, or if you're you know running from yeah. your uh, from your steering wheel. But you start doing that, and then you realize speed over ground. And I start looking around. I'm like, oh, you know what? We're basically hover fishing. We're yes. not moving. And that's something you have to be aware of. You need to turn it around and right. go the other direction. Yeah, right. So that's when you start playing that game where you run back up, troll yep. back. Yeah, you know, I prefer, current. especially estuary fishery, river fishery, I prefer to troll with the current. So do I. Uh, yeah. In the ocean, I don't, I'm not as picky about it. If we get a couple takedowns, I'll troll maybe another 100, 150 yards. If I don't get a takedown, I'm, I'm just I'm making a slow yep. corner, and I'm trying to cut back across that. Try to go find those fish So again. we ended up getting a couple takedowns, like I said, around 190. Uh, that died. We ran out to about 210 and found a really good current break and big kelp line. Oh, nice. And we dropped in on that kelp line, hoping to maybe find some bait along that kelp line. Mm -hmm. And same thing, drop in first five minutes, Couple takedowns. Did you find much bait? Uh, no, not at all. And that's been the biggest complaint that I, we found one bait school out there, and it wasn't a very big one. Oh. And that's been the biggest complaint I've heard from a lot of the anglers fishing out of Westport is there. There's not a lot of bait out there yet. Right. 
Uh, and so it's got the fish really scattered, I think, really spread out. What, um, uh, how many poles? You got line counters, you do right, poles. Right, line counters. Okay. Uh, we're running, running, we were running four rods. I yep. uh, had four guys in the boat. And one thing I am very particular about when fishing on my boat is we fish as a team. Right. We don't allow anybody just to grab a rod and go to whatever depth they want to on the line counter, okay? So we'll start, say, the left the left rod will be at 20 poles, and then the next one's at 24, and then the next one's at 28, then the next one's at 32, and we're working a water column of depth. Once we get a takedown, where was that takedown at? Oh, yeah. it was on that rod, yeah, so yeah. it was at 24. Right. So let's adjust everybody to 24 real quick and see if we can stay on those fish. Yeah. And we bounce those numbers around from 18 on the line counter we had mm -hmm. takedowns all the way down to 60 on the line counter we had takedowns. Yeah. But constantly, you know, if I go more than 15, 20 minutes without a takedown, I'm going to go back to a rod and say, well, let's drop it to 50 and see what happens. And you prefer uh, lead uh, over yeah. a diver? You ever fish yeah. divers out there? I just like to fish yeah, lead. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, I'm I just, just not a big diver guy. Yeah. I know with lead, especially running 16 ounces, mm -hmm. uh, running the 10 and a half foot mooching rods. Yep. Uh, one of the thing is my front two rods, I tend to be able to pick them up on my on my depth finder. Yeah. So I can see where those the are at physically. Are right. yeah. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. I, I know, and it gives me right off the bat, first thing in the morning, uh, I look down, I'll put that front rod, say on the port side down to 30 poles and I'll look and I'll see it at like 24 feet. Mm -hmm. Now I know with that line angle, at 30 on the line counter, yep. I'm 24 feet. Yeah. So when I start marking fish, I can use that equation, you know, 30 pole or 30 on the line counter equals 24 feet, and I can pinpoint those fish. Yeah. And it works great. Yeah. No, I mean it's uh, you can get extremely sophisticated with it, or yep. you can use a little bit of old school technique. And yep. you know, we're talking coho here, and lead flat out gets it done. Yeah. You know, I I would probably even think about if I'm not going to go target kings, I may even pull the downriggers off right. and leave them at home and just go fish lead. It's so much easier comfortable to do it's just right. you know a couple other things that we did that helped us put some fish in the box is anytime you reel in to check a bait or anytime you get a takedown it's like well i should check that bait didn't hook up fish it up reel it up slow yeah you know give a chance there was three or four times where we we reeled up slow and had a coho following it yeah so after that happened a couple times went okay I grabbed, I also packed on all my sea bass and lean cod mm -hmm. gear. And so we took one of the lean cod rods and I rigged it up with a moochin rig. Yeah. And we actually had a situation where we had a takedown, missed it, reeled it up slow. The coho followed it, put that rod in the boat because it didn't have a hook. It was following the flasher. Yeah. Grabbed that moochin rod, flipped it out, fed him some line and hooked that fish right behind the boat well, there with you the go. moochin rod. I was so. going to ask you, did you fish any herring naked without flashers? Or right. You just, just, yeah. just doing that. Just that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Just, just a that. moochin setup. Yep. So awesome. Yeah, that was a good day. It was a fun I, was, trip. Uh, I mean, we ended up putting five hatchery in the box. I think we caught six or seven fish. Probably had fifteen takedowns. It wasn't it wasn't fantastic ocean fishing by any five means. Coho. But, but I talked to a lot of people that went south like we did, and there was not a lot of fish caught down there. So we were pretty happy with the day. Didn't you have some gentlemen in another boat join you? Yeah, they come out. We're fishing. <laughs> we're fishing. I mean, we can't even <laughs> physically see another boat, so I don't know what that range is. Six, seven, eight miles where all boats are out of sight, and yeah. also we see a boat headed straight towards us and i figured it was probably wdfw and the zodiac They're like look at them guys look at these guys go, they come and they mess roll with them. right up next to us and go well you guys look like you know what you're doing and you're I'm like, like no motors are dead <laughs> we're just free drifting i don't know how they how they justified that they're back if you call for help our radio's down too right yeah. right but they they wanted to know if we'd had any luck i told them we had some fish in the box told them what depths and how we've been doing it mm -hmm. and and they kind of trolled around i don't know if they caught anything but oh. we stuck it out there for another 45 minutes or so and then ran way south down to the whistler off of willapaw right and didn't pick up anything there even though we had heard some reports there were some fish there mm -hmm. and and didn't get nothing there, and then we called it quits. If that was me, I'd be like, you mind if I put these bumpers out? I'm just going to tie tight yeah. to you. And yeah, just, I would, uh, that would have been great. Just kind of, yeah, yeah. Follow, follow your lead. We would have done it. I know you would. <laughs> awesome, man. So uh, coho for the Barbie, fantastic. Yeah. And, you know, it's only going to get better. We're going to talk about some of the fish numbers as well, if I remember to pull that page out. Um, right. We got some definite uh, cutbacks going on. Matter of fact, I did not print that off, and it's... Uh, yeah, I kind of need that information. I'll pull it up here okay. as we get into that. So right. um, while I do that, so let's talk a little bit about, uh, I'm going to pull that up. I got a bunch of information I want to cover okay. as we get into uh, going around the Northwest and beyond and throughout Puget Sound. Uh, let's talk a little bit about Willapa. Okay. There's a 
few fish being caught, but obviously it's yeah. still a little early. We're on the front edge of that fishery really Yeah, I got off, some right? questions on Facebook uh, the other day kind of asking how Willapaw's yeah. fishing. Have you heard anything? Uh, nothing spectacular at this point. I mean, I've heard of a few being caught here and there. Uh, Willapaw is probably... <sighs> I really, I really compare it for me like, like buoy tin time, like August 1st. When August 1st rolls around, I want to start focusing on that area wash away and <laughs> in towards Tokeland. And then as the month progresses, you know, we'll, you'll work your way up the bay. Uh, you really want to focus on those incoming high floods. Yep. Uh, the last two hours of the incoming high tide up until flood and sometimes the first half hour, 45 minutes of the ebb can be really good. But and, and low slack, you can catch some fish. I mean, if low slack is set up where low slack's at like 7 a.m., mm -hmm. I'd say go fish it. Yep. You know, if low slack's at like 10 in the morning, I'd say nah, yeah. maybe wait and put in for an afternoon fish. Sure. I yeah. mean, there's a lot of times we're all during the week. I'll go work, you know, a half a day, three quarters of a day, and then launch the boat at three in the afternoon to try to fish a five or six o'clock high slack. Yeah. You know, and it, Willapaw is a high slack fishery. Uh, it, it's that way out at Washaway. Mm -hmm. It's that way in towards North River, you know, in towards South Bend, everywhere. It's a high the slack. The couple fishery. years I've been fishing, I've always fished that incoming right up to high slack yeah. and just wait for it to start draining out. And typically the bite shuts down, you right. know, but. Right. Uh, now, Washaway tends to produce a little more fish all the way through the incoming, mm. uh, especially when it's fishing well, mm -hmm. uh, especially yeah. coho. When the coho are coming in, and I think. Especially if you're fishing, say, from that jetty along the highway that right. we talked about last week. Right. People can go to last week's show and talk, see some of the safety stuff on Willapaw. But from that jetty, say, out to the sea buoy, mm -hmm. which is basically the bar. I right. mean, you're basically fishing the bar. Uh, but on those incoming tides, those coho, I think, tend to get flushed into that pool. And then when the tide flips, they'll just head right back out. Yeah. They're not quite ready to come up river yet. Gotcha. And it can be really good there on a, you know, on the big minuses. Yeah. It can be really good there on that incoming. Um, <clears throat> typically, uh, I mean, obviously you're fishing lead. Yep. I like to spin herring out there. A lot yep. of guys do. I mean, it's a, it's a bait fishery for sure. Right. Um, haven't toyed a whole lot with spinners in the Willapaw. Now I like to run spinners out at, you know, out in the ocean. Yeah. Uh, usually run one or two rods with spinners. I didn't last week, but I usually do. Willapaw for me, spinners, not even a, a thought only because right. of the grass. Right. Uh, I mean, they're going to spin up and, uh, but right. later on, a couple weeks down the road here, as we get near that fishery, when's that thing really start popping for you? Mid August. Yeah. Yeah. So as we get there. We have some tricks and techniques that we're going to show you guys that actually work very well keeping that grass right. out of your rotators, off of your herring. It works fantastic. Right. It, it allows you to fish clean. Don't have to worry about it. I mean, once that grass sets in on your on your rollers, on your uh, fish flash and stuff, it's game over, man. You are spending there, your day so frustrated. There are many days on Willapaw where fishing four rods where whether it's the wife or a son driving the boat, where all I do is go from rod to rod Clearing to rod, grass. cleaning grass. Yep. I mean, you can't, that's one thing important. I mean, if you're dragging grass, you're not fishing. Right. And if you're not fishing, you ain't catching. Yeah. So, I mean, if you got to have a rotation where you're just cleaning rods the yep. whole times, you're going to bump up your takedown numbers. Well, and the other I mean, thing you gotta is, have clean yeah, bait. and nobody is, uh, nobody's just kicking it. Everybody's got eyes on the water looking for grass islands. Right. And, you know, grass flows and see where that current's pushing that grass line right. because... It's, it's it's so important just yeah. for the boat operator to avoid that stuff at all costs uh, because now you got four rods that are just absolute crap show and you're you're right. you know you're not fishing so right but we'll get into that that fishery is coming uh, get excited about that some of the hardest fighting kings oh I mean if you have not fished Willapaw and experienced the ability of those kings right. to pull. Right. We're and talking hatchery fish too that just yeah. absolutely will kick your ass. Yeah. It is and fantastic. As you get farther up the estuary, that's where the lead and the drop lead come in yeah. because I really like to work that bottom. Right. You know, if you haven't touched bottom in five minutes, you need to find bottom. You're not fishing. Right. Yeah. And that's one thing we do. And, you know, in the ocean, you know, we last week there. You know, in Willapaw, had really good luck with red and green flashers. Mm -hmm. uh, never really noticed a difference. Now, Sunday in the ocean, we ran a, a two UVs, oh. and then we ran a red and a green. Yep. The green flasher did not touch a fish to the point where we finally switched it to a UV and started to get bit. Started to get bit. So, yeah, so yeah. the UV was working really well, and so that's something 
I don't know that I've put the UV flashers to work a lot in Willapaw, yeah. but that's something that I'm going to spend, you know, really try to dial in this year on what flashers tend to work a little better. Willapaw is interesting because of the, the turbidity in the water, Yes. right? The yes. same for the Chehalis. Yes. It's interesting because of the turbidity in the water, and I've tried all different colors of flashers mm -hmm. and all different colors of herring. Some years it's a spinner bite for both Chinook and Coho. Uh, we cannot keep Chinook in there once again this year. Uh, and don't get me going on the 8,000 over escapement needs <laughs> that we don't get to fish on, right? right? We're talking hatchery fish. So that's a different <clears throat> story altogether. But now in that river, after fishing it for years, you kind of dial it in. It is a uh, chartreuse or chartreuse and green flasher. Mm -hmm. You can put all other colors on. And if folks, if you know, if you got other things to say about it, uh, great, chime in. Uh, that's why we got our, our messages up here. But historically, um, chartreuse and green or just flat out chartreuse, right. Right. Uh, flasher gets it done. And of all colors of herring, dark green. You would think chartreuse with the highest properties of UV would be the standout color for Coho and Chinook in the right. Chehalis. But I'm here to tell you, hands down time and time again, dark green with Potsky's Firebrine has gotten it done just hand over fist. Right. I don't get why. I mean, it has a high quality of UV to it as right, well. Right. But for some reason, that dark green just flat out gets it Here's done. Here's what I'll say is after this this weekend and fishing the ocean and, and having the situations where after a takedown, we'd crank up slow and have fish following, mm -hmm. they were following the flasher. Yeah. And so for me, it's always been like, eh, a flasher's a flasher. Right. You know, they're going to chase it. But I really, after this weekend, went, wow, flasher color really matters, and flashers are really important because these fish are keying in on that flasher, and even though multiple times we had takedowns that we missed and cranked it up, and no bait, right. and there's a coho following that flasher all yeah. the way up. The most productive flashers right. are 11-inch flashers, are, right. ro are uh, rolling flashers, not the rotators, right. that we use predominantly in Puget Sound. You're going to find a lot of manufacturers have gone to a two-sided UV one side, glow on the other. Mm -hmm. Why? You can't go wrong. You're giving them both UV and glow. One of not both is going to work all the time. Right. In the in the different depths and the light, the lack of light. Right. But UV penetrates deep. Glow, it'll be charged up. It'll carry light right. down deep uh, when you're balancing off bottom for them Chinook. So a lot of that to get into as our fisheries progress yep. through July and into August, into September. Uh, we'll be tackling these fisheries. We'll be talking lower estuary fisheries, Willapa Bay, out there in Grays Harbor. We got a great opportunity for them. Big Grays Harbor coho this year in, right. in the bay. Going to be on top of all of that. So uh, things to look forward to. I mean, you already got out in the ocean. You've been chiming to get out in the ocean. and you got out there. So we're going to roll right into how good our oceans have been fishing. They've been flat out kicking ass and producing fish to the point we talked about last week. Hey, we may be on the heels here of ha actually seeing some things getting cut back right. because of um, the over uh, overproduction, um, over uh, performing, I guess, right. um, based on what the allocations that were. And predicted. we did see a cut. We did see a cut back on the north side, right up in the CQ area. So uh, for Nia Bay, we right. talked about last week. Uh, they were going to drop it to one fish and did yep. actually this last week, July fourteenth. Uh, it's closed to Chinook retention. Wow, Started on July 14th. Wow. If you miss that and you're going out to fish uh, Nia Bay, closed for Chinook retention. You can now keep, still remaining to keep two adult fish, uh, but they both have to be hatchery coho. And the reason they close the Chinook fishing is because those additional encounters that we will eat up during the coho opportunity is just that. We have to have a bumper of Chinook available that we can encounter and release because there's a mortality rate associated with that. And if you want to keep Chinook fishing and retain Chinook, we can do that right up to the very end of the quota. But then they also shut down coho fishing because we can right. no longer have impacts on your Chinook. So for anybody that's confused about that or doesn't understand, the reason they close the Chinook fishing is so we have a longer season uh, extending into summer and we can still target coho. So uh, Chinook fishing in Nia Bay is done. Uh, La Push, uh, as of the 15th, uh, your Chinook retention is limited to one. So out of your uh, two fish limit, you are now able to keep one hatchery Chinook. As far as Marine Area 6, uh, they got some nice news there. We're opening it up seven days per week uh, for uh, shrimping. 
If you hadn't uh, picked up on that, July 15th, they put that out. Marine Area 6 have additional opportunity for going after uh, some spot prawns. So that's pretty exciting in that regard, seven days a week. Um, also on the 16th, this is a busy week with openings and right. closings and, and limit restrictions. And that's going to keep going on also. Yeah, we'll have. Yeah. And you know what? For those that may get frustrated with that, I'm here to tell you. After sitting in meetings for years in WDFW, setting a season and just going with it and not um, adhering to, or listening to those of us out there fishing that wanted in-season right. management, this is a benefit for all. Because if, uh, if they set season and just fish, right and we go beyond quotas and everything because they have a time stamp on it that really makes the following season's ability to set season with co-managers very difficult because time and time again on years where the where the um, uh, runs are overperforming we're going to overfish them and that becomes problematic down the road right. so this in season adjustments uh, for recreational fishing is always a benefit right. don't you know look at it as a black eye right and i'm thinking at least from what i've seen so far this year through the three or four bottom fishing trips that i did and then this salmon fishing trip that i did they've had a fish checker there every time yeah. in westport yeah and i mean they're checking every boat there and in fact on sunday i think i seen three so i mean that's what has to happen right for there to be realistic in season management accuracy you know, accuracy we're not right. just talking paper fish anymore some of right. these larger fisheries that openings and closings openings specifically bring out the fleet yes. and when you announce an opening Everybody loads the boats, calls in sick, and they head for the water. And they want to be on top of not just, you know, kind of putting a swag guess at it. They want to be on top of what these accurate fish counts are. So um, <clears throat> we had an opening on the Upper Columbia okay. uh, on the 16th, and, and the fishing was actually pretty darn good. Facebook and social media was blowing up on the 16th, the morning of, within the first couple hours. Uh, lots of folks getting limits, a handful of folks struggling. Those that have those fisheries dialed up there by yep. Slam Falls and whatnot are doing very well. And actually, later on the show, we're going to talk to Sam Baird, uh, Slam and Salmon Guide Service, Sexy Sammy, as we like to call him. <laughs> um, he's been up there fishing. He's running trips, ran a trip today, probably running a trip tomorrow. Uh, that fishery is open through October, and the fishing is actually very good. Our buddy Herzog was sending me pics all day the other day and also sent me pictures. And if you haven't seen those fish filleted out and how they present on a table you're missing out you think those things are three four hundred miles up river and they're going to be dark on the outside slightly a little bronzed up some of them are kind of gray uh looks like a pretty you know yeah. decent chinook you cut them open red as can be it's all about the oh. genetics we've talked about it for years those up river fish are something to be had so chinook fishing up in that area is two adult chinook um, the use of barbless hooks is optional Yep. Columbia River, right? Yep. We changed that back in uh, June. So uh, the fact that you can now uh, choose or not to use barbless hooks is entirely up to you. And I got to think most guys are probably just <laughs> not pinching their barb. Why would you? Yeah, right? so, I mean, that's, that's a tough choice. Uh, yeah, it is. I don't know. Oh, what should I do? What I feel, should I do okay, here? two rods on the, right. On, the, on the right side here. We're going to fish barbs, and you guys yeah. are going without... We're going to help try to find balance in, in this equation. Right, so yeah, I only want to catch half the fish I hook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe 30% of the fish I hook. Uh, so uh, we've talked a lot about Chinook fisheries, opportunities happening now, cutbacks, yes, but for the better of the good and, you know, yeah. coho opportunity, we got fisheries to look forward to. I'm yep. taking a ton of time off work and <laughs> got to start hitting the water. Uh, we won't get into that. Uh, so Shane Van Linda popped in here and he says, in many areas, it seems like Chinook return has been better than projected. Yeah. Do you think this is true? Uh, I think it is. I think uh, in talking with a handful of folks, they would agree. Now, right. um, are I'm still we a little skeptical of that just because of what we saw with the spring Chinook. Yeah. I, I, I well, think so we, we've had a wetter than normal July. Absolutely. Which could have these fish push a little closer mm -hmm. to the entrance to the estuaries, which has made them easier to target. It is the, are we getting a big push of fish early? Right. And then we're going to hit a lull and then it doesn't ever pick up. Right. That's the concern. Right. Um, hopefully, obviously, uh, no. Uh, we'd like to see it sustained. Now, For keep sure. in mind, one of the reasons, and we kind of talked about this last week as well, we have 12% reduction in Northwest Fisheries agreements that, you know, Canada's uh, allowing those fish to come by. Uh, it's, it's timed commercial harvest that they are paying attention to. And there's certain points here where they're not fishing, allowing 
uh, parts of these runs to actually get past them right. and down to us. Right. And I think on this front edge of our fall salmon opportunity, especially relative to these Chinook, again, that's all part of part of restructuring some of these fisheries based on the needs of the uh, South Resident Orcas, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, a good segue, because that's what we're jumping into next. Right. Uh, <laughs> but part of this front load on this thing is secondary to that 12% margin that they're allowing to come uh, right. from the north and get down here. Right. And you know what? I they could bump that to 50%. I'd be just happy as could be. And <laughs> right. I think a lot of other people would right. be as well. But good question, Shane. Uh, time yeah. will tell, you know. Um, yeah, time will tell. But, I mean, early, the fishing for Chinook has been decent. Well, so. and the other thing to pay attention to is the size of these early fish. Right. They're big. Right. And if big fish early is an indicator of ocean conditions, you would there logically think that conditions are right. favorable for a substantial uh, survivability that's going to keep right. just kind of filing in on a continuous basis is what we hope for. Uh, we should be fishing Chinook uh, long into the summer yep. if things go according to plan, right? So I mentioned the South Resident Orcas. Uh, yeah, I kind of put a post out there earlier in the week on our Facebook. And, uh, you know, over there at uh, Northwind Sportsman's Magazine, Andy Walgomount and the, and the gang do a really great job. He had put an article together referencing uh, the Lummies uh, pitch increased Chinook release for orcas, hatchery opponents dig in. And Andy took time to actually uh, link a couple other articles that had been written earlier in the week. And this is that, um, are people screaming, you know, is it chicken uh, little? Or are we just freaking out and saying, oh, this is a great opportunity to, uh, to get on this bandwagon of save the orcas right. the recreational people because they just want to get more fish in the water so we can go after them right that is a byproduct of the fact that the orcas need to eat right i mean you could flip that whichever way you want but the the end of the day uh it's been recognized by several marine biologists and those following these orcas for years that there is a problem and one of the biggest problems is lack of food lack yep. of them their ability to find nourishment um it's no secret that the amount of chinook returned to puget sound has been drastically cut now being not familiar with puget sound and and how everything works in puget sound are seals and sea lions a huge impact on chinook in puget sound like they are say in the columbia or the Chehalis or so there's two sides in, of that. in the adult side as yeah. they're returning well uh let's jump back to that because i want to i want to okay. make sure we cover that real okay. quick but okay. um in referencing these articles so there was one posted out by the uh the seattle times uh on the 16th and it was written by uh ken balcom he is a contracted whale biologist for the U.S. government, has been doing so since 1963. So Ken's been doing it for 56 years. Okay. I know this because I was born in 66. <laughs> <laughs> so um, he has studied the Southern Resident Killer Whale population since 1976. So I was 10 years old. So he's been doing that for 40 years. So he right? is the expert. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, and he was uh, he was uh, appointed to the governor's task force when they were uh, right. developing all the information to decide what decisions to be made. Reference uh, how are we going to approach providing food for the orcas. You know, is it a, is it a serious situation that needs to be resolved? Yes, everybody agrees. Moving forward, it's interesting with his credentials and the amount of time he has in from a scientific and biological marine biological standpoint. He is. Quoted in uh, this article he wrote uh, for the Times in that I recommend starting with returning natural flow conditions to the Snake River to allow for millions of baby salmon to hatch in the pristine upper reaches of the river. Now, Barnum, we've talked about that time and time again. We're talking about blowing out dams on the Snake. Right. Four of them at a cost of millions, right. millions approaching billions of dollars to right. allow salmon to move freely up and down the river. Now, we all know that's not going to happen. Um, you have a, a strong group of uh, persons supporting that ideology. Um, it's a great conversation to have, but there's so many factors. I mean, Man. we could just, uh, we're here, right? <laughs> Humans mean, are here. Yeah. We're changing the landscape. We get right. that. We've decimated habitat. We get that. Uh, we'll get into the habitat thing here in a minute. He also goes on to say the only real solution for reversal of the downhill trend of Chinook salmon in size, remember I talked about yep. size earlier, in yep. uh, size is everything, in case you were wondering, um, and abundance, and for the southern resident killer whale population, is to recover the natural wild runs of Chinook 
and their supporting ecosystem as soon as possible. So Ken is going on as far to say that the hatchery stuff is debunked, basically if you read his article, and uh, the effort needs to be made to bring back the wild fish. Okay, that was, that was one uh, article and a few excerpts from that. Uh, another one that was put out by a, a group of three or, three or four folks from the Vancouver Sun. It's an opinion piece. Um, it says, opinion, more salmon hatcheries will not help killer whales or Chinook, okay? Uh, a couple excerpts from that. While seemingly logical at first blush, the idea lacks biological or ecological basis. Further pursuing the strategy could undermine recovery efforts for wild Chinook and needed rebuilding of runs throughout their historic range. Their size and their age and structure and run timing that whales have evolved to be familiar with. Uh, there are several reasons for this. It goes on to say hatcheries have failed to protect or restore old ages, big size, range, and migration times, the diversity of wild Chinook and uh, of salmon. And for southern residents to recover, the age, structure, and run timing of wild Chinook, along with abundance, needs to be restored. In other words, they're saying hatcheries have just polluted um, Puget Sound with Chinook that all come back at the same time. Not true. Uh, hatchery production and more so now you, you know what right. uh, it's no secret 40 years ago they were screwing it up big time right everybody can agree with that genetic strains have been altered we can all agree with that the genetics that are uh, pre are relevant and prevalent in river systems today are somewhat washed down but they've now recognized those basins to say, this is the genetic strain for the Puyallup Basin. This right. is the genetic strain for the Skagit Basin. This is, and, and that's what they're moving forward with, right? Right. And we can get into the brood stocking. That's we just get, what I was gonna say. We, you know what fixes size, yes, time of run, yes. all of abundance, the brood Quinault, stocking. The Quinaults have proven that brood stocking, right. selective uh, harvest of fish out of their rivers is producing larger fish time and time again. Right. If you're not familiar with their steelhead program, you need to be so because it is shown that selega, selective harvest and breeding of these fish in a hatchery environment and uh, release at appropriate times is rebuilding fish runs. Uh, hatchery and wild is on board with all of this and that's right. why we're such a strong supporter of this. Right. Um, these articles are written by folks who don't really want to see recreational fishing continue. No. Okay, and um, when we start talking about, well, there's articles that, that state we're gonna put net pens out in Puget Sound, and people get uh, concerned, because we all know how detrimental yes. to the environment net pens raising Atlantic salmon uh, up north uh, between us and Canada, if we have these large floating masses of net pens and you hear about all the bad diseases and the, the lice that gets on our outbounding right. smolt and all these problems with net pens, when we're talking Chinook net pens in Puget Sound, we're not talking rearing them until adult and then release them like uh, a bunch of rabbits for hounds, right? We are talking about rearing smolt to a healthy size to where their survivability is much stronger. And depending on run timing, when you release those fish, they're either going to outbound to ocean and return as adults, or they're going to residualize within Puget Sound exactly like they have going on now between some of the tribal uh, uh, co-managers in hatchery programs and WDFW hatchery programs which produce our blackmouth fisheries. Right. So there's two components there. You have your residual resident blackmouth that are producing net pens at prior to release and you have your, as we talked to Art Tashel down at Point Defiance, they put those pens in between Point Defiance and Narrows Bridge. Um, those are slated to be released. Those will be out migrating fish that come back. Strays from those fish going into those nearby rivers are not a problem because the gene selection is from those basins. Right. Right? right. So he made it very clear that we're not going to have an issue with a few strays of those fish finding their way up into uh, some of those Puget Sound River basins. So the, uh, the fact that the Wild Fish Conservancy folks and supporters and the Native Fish Society and supporters are going down this road of continuing to write articles uh, for the most part, not supported by modern science in what we've learned through hatchery and wild coexist and other programs that are now showing fitness levels of hatchery fish can revert back and have. They will, they, if you read through these articles, they're going to give you all the same data points that have been crammed down our throats for years that when they, when they spawn with wild fish in the rivers, it, it brings down the fitness level, the survivability, and all these things 
you know, weaken these wild fish runs. Couldn't be further from the truth. I okay? just, you just don't see it. I mean, if a salmon, whether it's released from a hatchery or whether it's, you know, a natural occurring fish, they get out to the ocean, they survive the, they survive the gauntlet of yeah. leaving. Yeah. They get out to the ocean, they thrive in the o- ocean, they survive the gauntlet of returning. Right. These are, I mean, these are healthy, strong fish that make it to the spawning grounds. And when they, when they stray and don't necessarily go back to a hatchery and they spawn with wild fish right. in the river, those, those that hatch out uh, survive as fry in the river uh, for a year yes. to 18 months, depending on species, and actually reach smolt and outbound, they survive and come back and spawn. Right. That first generation is a wild fish, right. conceivably. And the way they act, their mature rate, their ability to put on weight, their survivability, their instincts, all those things that they've learned because they hatched out of the gravel right. hold true for those fish that originally their parent was reared in a hatchery. Right. So they've proven this. It's taken a lot of time to get people on board with understanding this. If those folks writing these articles in opposition to survivability, uh, the Lummies did a nice job on talking in favor. Uh, Lorraine Loomis came out not too long ago talking in favor. Several tribes are on board working as co-managers with WDFW. And the governor's plan increasing hatchery reared Chinook salmon in the efforts to save the orcas. Um, This other stuff is just getting in the way. Right. And the scariest part about this is you have to remember, I mean, fishing, if you're watching this show or you're one of us, fishing, I mean, we understand this stuff. Fishing is huge to us. But to majority of the population, it... They don't understand the science of salmon. They don't understand any of it. So when these articles get put in these metropolitan papers, opinion pieces like these ones, they come across and people read this. And when they don't know the facts and they don't understand the ecology of what's going on, they tend to believe this stuff. And it is, without a doubt, a war on hatcheries. And unless we step up as sports fishermen and be the defense line Mm -hmm. and stand proud and say that, you know, we have to prevent this. If we lay back on this, it's an invasion that we're, we're going to get overrun. The Seattle times article, uh, where it predominantly extends out to what's the percentage of moms who watch their kids play soccer on the weekends. Right. No offense. Read that article and go, Oh, well, yeah. You know, because they don't fish. They're right. in a big metropolitan city. They're right. just, they're just, you know, living their life, working hard, raising kids. Yep. They're surrounded by walls. They don't do the outdoor thing. Uh, they might read this as a, uh, as an informational piece and go, hmm, that's interesting, huh? Right. And that's kind of where it's at for them. Right. They really don't know the grassroots of this thing or why these articles are being, you know, strewn out. They're trying to build right. this army of those in opposition to rearing more salmon to right. save the whales. Uh, there's a lot more people carrying the flag to save the whales, obviously. Yeah. We just need to make right. sure you're getting educated by the right scientific right. modern day data that supports the fact that we can release more Chinook. Right. I mean, for crying out loud, Barnum, a lot of our hatchery production on our Chinook is down in some regards in, in some of our estuaries and systems, 60 mm-hmm. to 75%. Right, I they mean, cut, we've seen it on Willapaw, prime example. Oh yeah, they 90%. Cut the, they cut the Forks Creek hatchery by 90%. 90%, right. okay. We need those fish back. Uh, advocate or uh, you know supporters of this type of building returning hatcheries to max production uh, representative Brian Blake and his committee works and those folks uh, working down at uh, in Olympia and we need a lot more folks to jump on board and spread this information right. so we will continue to help carry that flag to answer your question on the seals and the sea lions and the Salish Sea um, part of the big problem is a number of harbor seals on the outbounding out migrating smoke okay they consume millions of pounds of smolt, but on the return, um, the seal population of all different species that reside up in there are intercepting a, a lot of okay. the adult salmon as well. Right. Because um, we hear about the predation on the Columbia all the time, yeah. but we don't hear a lot of numbers on predation in Puget Sound. The government's pl- the govern- government the governor's plan in the orca recovery in the task force. It was noted that a few million dollars were allocated to ongoing research to truly uh, pull in the data to say exactly how big of impact right. the harbor seals and gray seals and whatnot are having on out migrating smolt and how big of impact some of the other seals uh, the strains are having on returning adult salmon. So right. more on that to come. Uh, we're up against a hard break here, so we're gonna jump out. And when we come back, what we got going on? Oh, slamming salmon, Sammy. 
right? Yep. Is that what your sheet says? That's what my sheet says. We're talking upper riv river Columbia fish. Yeah, more Chinook talk. I can't talk tonight. Yeah, me either. <laughs> I'm tired. More <laughs> Chinook talk, upper reaches of the Columbia River with our good buddy uh, Sam Baird of Slam and Salmon Guide Service. Uh, we'll figure out that fishery with him that opened on the 16th, how well it's performing and what you need to know to get over to the east side and go get some of those nice Chinook. We'll do that when we come back right here on Fish on Northwest. At Metal Supermarkets, we understand your need for fast access to a wide variety of metals. So we've made it easy. Our network of stores carries a wide variety of metal in all different types, shapes, sizes, and grades, with no required minimum order size. Who could ask for more? Simply tell us your dimensions online, on the phone, or in store, and we'll cut or process the metal to your desired size, often while you wait. We offer same-day service and can deliver the metal right to your door or job site. We even source hard-to-find metals, so no matter what you're looking for, metal supermarkets can provide it for you. And we're conveniently located with brick-and-mortar stores in Seattle and Portland, so you can check out our extensive stock for yourself. Superior customer service is guaranteed. Quality service from real people who know metal. We are the small quantity metal experts. To place an order, simply call a store to talk to one of our knowledgeable customer service representatives, fill out a quote request online, order off of our e-commerce website, or visit one of our many locations and pick out the metal you want. Whether you're a small or large business, government, homeowner, or hobbyist, we make it easy for you to buy the exact metal and just the amount you need. We've been doing this for over 30 years, so we know how to get it done. Metal Supermarkets, the convenience stores for metal. Visit or call a Metal Supermarket store near you today. Hey, welcome back to Fish on Northwest. Uh, Barnum, we kind of ran a little long on that one, but uh, I think the information is one that people need to continue to regurgitate. Yeah, you know sure. that That stuff's not going away anytime soon. We're going to be dealing with the orchid thing for quite some time. And uh, as that trickles over, we are either are the recipients or not of the you know additional salmon that are produced. Yeah, so. it's like you said. I mean, there's two different parties parties carrying the flag here. Yeah. You have the pro hatchery people saying, you know, let's create a bunch more fish. Right. And then now all of a sudden you have these anti hatchery people saying, no, hatchery fish are bad. We need wild fish to feed orcas only. That's a fantastic segue because the next right. guy we're going to talk to is not only pro hatchery but anti pro. Oh, so, uh, Mr. Sam Baird, longtime friend and uh, frequent caller of FHN. <laughs> so, <laughs> how you doing, Sammy? 
Pretty good. How you doing there, Dwayne? Hey, we're doing good, pal. Uh, Sam Baird, folks, if you're not familiar, slamming Sammy's Guide Service over on the east side out of Wenatchee area and all around. Uh, been friends for years, and Sam is flat out getting it done on that Upper Columbia, which opened on the 16th. Uh, Chinook opportunity, finally. I bet you were glad to see that finally open for you. Oh, most definitely. You know, I had a great kokanee season this year up on Lake Chelan, but it was time to start chasing something bigger. So when we finally got the word that it was opening, it was pretty exciting for everybody over here. Let's talk about the area that's open. We don't have to be specific about which exact area you are targeting, although uh, as you posted on Facebook the other day, um, you're receiving how many phone calls a day to say, hey, where are you fishing? But right. let's talk about the boundaries of from which dam to which dam or area we are open and uh, – how how uh, much how many river miles folks can anticipate uh, opportunity to go after them? So basically, what they did for us this year is normally we're open from above Priest Rapids Dam clear up to Chief Joseph Dam. Uh, this year they opened what they referred to as a bubble fishery uh, and only open the waterway between Rocky Reach Dam and Wells Dam. So we're looking at there, you know, approximately. They're about 45 miles of river. Um, not all of it is super productive fishery wise. Uh, most of the fish are piling up near the river mouths. So, so that's kind of where we're targeting. Right. What, what depth are you finding these fish at as far as not only where are you targeting them as far as catching them, but what depth of water overall are you seeing these fish kind of congregate in? So our summer run fish up here, they, they run super shallow early on in the season. Um, like even opening day, we were catching them, you know, 10, 15 feet deep in, you know, 20 feet of water. Uh, after that opening day uh, barrage of fish, I mean, opening day is just, it's unbelievable over here. Um, they, they instantly go deep. Today I was targeting 50 to 70 feet of water and catching them anywhere between, 30 and 50 feet down. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, so are you, uh, this a downrigger fishery, Sammy, or are you running lead? Uh, so both running leads early in the morning when the fish are still up shallow. Uh, they spook super early. So then they go deeper. Okay. Um, it, here in the next week or so, they'll, they'll just stay deep, but then come, you know, if we keep it open through August, then they'll actually start to shallow back up again mm. as they move in closer to the shores. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> is this uh, mostly a bait fishery? What's your uh, what's your bait or lure of choice that seems to be getting it done? Let's talk a little bit of uh, colors too for those that are trying to decide what colors and types of flashers or dodgers and you know UVs or not. Let's just break it all down for them. All right. So basically, what you know what, what you break down is you break down all of our fisheries here on the Upper Columbia are are a tale of two seasons. You got the, the early and the late when the fish are fresh and just getting up here. I'm running a lot more uh, super baits right now, uh, mini cup plugs to the original cup plugs, and a lot of the blues, greens, and naturals. Um, running those behind uh, short bus flashers in, in really any of the colors, but more of the greens, the darks, silvers. Um, so trolling those as the sea, and stuffing them full of tuna fish. Uh, mine is scented with my, with my own scent brand. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but send them with anything, you know, more, more feed oriented, herrings, tunas, stuff like that. As the season kind of progresses on here, then the fish will start getting a lot more aggressive. And then we start running a lot more of the 3.5 spinners behind our 11-inch uh, pro trolls. But so basically, and, and any of those in copper, gold, uh, oranges, reds, but so as the season progresses, progresses like even with the super baits, and you want to start going with brighter colors, the the chartreuses, the reds, so like things like lava, uh, hot tamale, anything like that. But early in the season, I find that more uh, more naturals or greens and blues seem to work a lot better. Well, there's a uh, there's an old adage or understanding that uh, as as chinook and or salmon in general progress in river, you know the the colors in their eyes that they pick up uh, changes. So, and uh, this is more so for fish down closer to the salt water, but when they come out of the salt water for the first several weeks, they are more apt to respond to blues and greens, which makes sense in black. 
uh, in silvers because they've been chasing bait fish right. for the most part. And as they you know, migrate further up river, uh, they respond a lot stronger to brighter colors, catch their attention because right. the cones and the colors uh, that they pick up in their eyes are changing as their body deteriorates. So I find it interesting that you just stated in that progression, right. that's what you're finding is working right. and you guys are that far up the river. So that's interesting, Sammy. Um, well, s- go ahead. Well, you got to think back in the day, you know, before the super baits came out and people really started running a bunch of spinners, you know, all we all ran were cut plug herring. So right, right. we never really paid attention much to color. And then all of a sudden, a few of us start dyeing our herring different colors. And you started realizing that the darker or, you know, the brighter colors, you know, dyeing them red and bright chartreuses were working later in the year. So it's the same with the super bait. Right. Good point. Yeah. Yep. So um, you are fishing mostly uh, Chelan Falls area or... In that stretch of river, is it very crowded uh, where you're at? I mean, what's the boat boat numbers look like day in and day out? So, so basically, I'm bouncing around between you know three different locations: Chelan Falls, uh, the the Wells Dam area, uh, just bouncing back and forth every day, depending on what water flows are doing and such. Uh, some places fish better in low water flows. Some places fish better in high water flows. Uh, the boat situation is pretty. Uh, yeah, it, it's pretty crowded right now. I mean, um, the first three days, we're only three days into the season, but there's more boats than I've ever seen because, again, they only opened a small section sure, right. of this upper Columbia. So, like, not having the Brewster pool open, that brings another 120 boats down into that lower section that are never there. Right. And right. so, like, op- opening day at Chelan Falls, you know, normally that hole can hold six uh, – Let's say 40 to 50 boats comfortable fishing. Okay. Uh, word was there was 90 to 100. Oh, wow. <laughs> nice. And, <laughs> and that was on a Tuesday. Right? Yeah. Well, like I mentioned oh, earlier in the show, you know, openings and folks decide to call in sick and right. it's time to go fishing. We got opportunity and that's typically what happens. So um, it sounds like it's fishing pretty well for those uh, such as yourself that kind of have it dialed in. Um, do you think the the fishery is going to sustain and or do you think we'll hit a point here if the numbers continue that they will open that Brewster pool I know they always have that annual fish and derby latter part of August uh, do we think that's going to happen this year so I I believe that the Brewster pool will open this year I mean there's some rumors circulating around about when it will open okay the thing is is we had that up there last year we actually have more fish in the upper Columbia than we had last year, but yet it, 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 they're not opening it yet uh, due to wanting a certain number of escapement over Wells Dam. Sure. Um, but, but what's really got us all kind of worried right now is the, the tribal boats are up there netting, and so we don't know what they're taking away from the escapement to actually get it to be open. Yeah. Yeah, interesting point. So, I mean, that is... If all things, one benefit of the dams is the accuracy of the fish counts. And we will know what the tribal boat takes out once those fish uh, get to the next dam. You know, that is one thing that you cannot, uh, there's one fishery, there's no hiding the numbers on that for sure. So uh, you got any openings coming up, Sammy, in the next uh, several weeks or how's your bookings look? Honestly, I do not, Dwayne. As soon as they they announce this opening, I fully booked in two days. But I do have (laughs) several other guide buddies that that have openings. Okay. want to get in touch with me they can yeah how can they reach out to you what's the best way uh just by my phone number 509-679-0483 or look me up on facebook at slam and salmon guide service slam and salmon guide service always a pleasure buddy always enjoy catching up and uh watching you uh catch bigger fish you know those fish are looking a lot bigger now because you're so damn small <laughs> yeah that was the whole plan of it all yeah, gotcha. Try to make the fish look bigger. Yeah, a boy. Well, you're doing a great job, Sam. We'll, we'll keep in touch, buddy. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for taking the time. All right. Thanks, bud. Take yeah, care. You bet. All right. Bye. Sammy gets it done. Yeah. He's all over on that east side. Uh, if you haven't connected with him or followed him on Facebook, I suggest you do so. Sam Baird, he likes to uh, proclaim he's anti-pro and he's tired of all the pro staff and all that stuff, but he's just all about uh, good-hearted fun. And, you know, congrats on him. He has dropped a significant amount of weight this last year doing keto diet. He is an advocate for keto. And I tell you what, I think he's close, if not as uh, surpassed 100 pounds. He's doing fantastic. Healthy, awesome. looking good, uh, 
feeling great, putting in long days, getting people on fish, and very successful in a lot of the fisheries that he does. So hats off to Sammy, good guy. And if you book a trip with him or check out what he has going on, you're going to have a great time. Okay, we're going to jump out. Something we have not done for a couple weeks, Barnum has jumped into the bait lab to yeah. talk about a few things. <clears throat> we have multiple opportunities here. Later on the show, we're going to talk with uh, Cal Stocking of Cause for Divorce Guide Service. As David says, probably the very best name of a guide service uh, in the state. And there's a little truth to that one, by the way. So uh, Cal's a fantastic guy. One, if not the go-to guy in the Baker Lake sockeye fishery that has uh, opened and some folks are finding success. Uh, A lot of folks are getting frustrated and struggling. There is, in most regards, if you look on social media, it seems to be about a two to three fish boat average for a day of work put in up there. Um, Water's up, conditions are challenging. Cal's gonna break that down for us later on. Along with that, we're gonna talk to our longtime friend, good buddy, Todd Daniels, Tall Tales Guide Service. Believe it or not, fishing the Cowlitz River for summer steelhead, and it might be, in all indicators, performing better than most folks would anticipate. It's actually not doing too bad. Right. Well, the reason I bring those up is because, as I mentioned, we're gonna jump into the bait lab. I'm gonna cover a few things in the past. Guys have asked us to break down the Baker Lake sockeye fishery. Uh, lures of choice, I'm gonna show you a progression of lures that I have uh, created and tied over the years and found success up there. We're gonna talk a little bit about dodgers and creating lots of flash and ruckus, as I like to say, to draw those, uh, those uh, sockeye in. And I'm also gonna talk a little bit about coon shrimp, one of my all-time favorite baits to use this time of year because we're talking sockeye, we're talking summer steelhead. And I'm gonna show you three different ways to rig your coon shrimp on your uh, presentation for your sockeye. And we're gonna cross over and show you bait diver and coon shrimp rig for summer steelhead and maybe even put one under a float to show you how that works. Uh, all that in the bait lab when we come back right here on FHN. Hey, welcome back to FHN. We are here in the bait lab. Finally, I know it's been a couple weeks and folks have been asking for a few more tutorials. So guess what? We're back in here and we're gonna kinda 
hurry on through this, albeit, you know, be some good information. Just try to keep up because uh, we're going to run out of time far too early tonight. We've got too much going on. So, uh, first of all, Fish and Sockeye, Baker Lake, pretty much your only opportunity. Last week, we kind of went over some numbers. Washington Lake, obviously, is not going to happen. Columbia River is dismal. Your focus is up north on Baker Lake. The numbers are pretty ample. I got to be honest, I didn't check the numbers today, but as of last week, there's about 2,500 plus that have been taken out of the fish trap, <clears throat> put up into the lake. So there is opportunity. Weather has been a little challenging the last few days. We had a lot of rain up there. You are higher in elevation. You're up there at the base of Mount Baker. Beautiful really surreal place to go give it an opportunity but as we'll talk with cal later in the show water conditions are up a little bit of wood floaty debris that is out in the lake as often is the case this time of year when the water comes up you got to be careful when you get up on step and head up to the other end of the lake where you're going to target these sockeyes so some things to think about uh we'll get into the lures and presentation but don't think you got to go all heavy and uh you know big gear for these things yeah they're sockeye salmon but guess what kokanee gear works fantastic i fish nothing other than my standard kokanee rods i've been using for years and do yourself a favor use your kokanee rods you're going to absolutely enjoy it some of the bigger ones we got a few years ago eight and nine pound range on kokanee rods are you kidding me fantastic way to go about it and you'll have a very good time so simply pick up your kokanee rods use your reels that have some means of a line counter whether it's digital or um, uh, mechanical and uh, make sure you dial in your program knowing exactly your depths and your setbacks okay let's tighten it up a little bit here and talk specific gear okay um, sockeye are interesting creatures in that Oftentimes, you know, you think you got them figured out and other times it's all about changing your presentation to figure out exactly what they want. You can see in progressive order here, I have smaller beaded uh, lures or presentations with just a simple little LP squid that adds additional UV and body to the uh, overall lure. Some definite uh, glow beads or UV beads is exactly what those are with a small uh, a little mylar smile blade, always running a smile blade to add uh, pulsation, uh, color, and uh, uh, some energy to the, to the lure, as I like to call it. Uh, you also notice that I have a small straw right over the top of the hooks. I'm going to show you the reason for that in a minute here. As we progress up, getting a little larger in profile, uh, we have a basically a tube fly of sorts. Uh, pre-made by, uh, by uh, uh, you know, various companies. You can find these uh, all over the place, or you can tie them yourself. Uh, simply slide them down your leader. They sit on top of your coon shrimp or sand shrimp, if you choose, um, at the top end of your lure. Couple uh, UV beads, another small blade. Getting even larger, these uh, silver hoard uh, small little hoochie presentations. This is the Junior Ace High Fly. Works fantastic. Lots of UV, lots of flash, tapered head. Again, running a smile blade on this with some with some UV beads. I have some uh, other larger six mil UV beads that are in uh, above the hooks for the body. And all these lures and progressing to even this larger squid, this little Silver Horde Squid got a uh, Yakima bait uh, candy blade on there that has UV and a lot of uh, flash and color in pinks. Again, you're going to notice one thing that's consistent. Most of these lures are pink. I found over the years that with sockeye, they really respond to pink lures overall. So uh, when you find what's working for you, why change it? Uh, when you decide to take pink off, go ahead and put pink back on because that's what's going to get it done. All of these lures are tied on one aught drop shot hooks. These uh, are Saka, they have fairly big mouths, so I go with the one aught hooks. And we have a straw on here to help secure my bait. Now, some people like to fish sand shrimp for sockeye. Uh, sand shrimp will work and there's different, you know, some guys will simply run a small couple beads in a spinning glow and drag your sand shrimp around and they'll, they'll uh, wrap that with some magic thread or however you put that on there so it stays. I've always been kind of drawn to the um, coon shrimp and the recipe that I uh, make year in and year out works for sockeye very well, it works for summer steelhead, it works for coho, 
I stick with it, it's proven. Showed you several, several shows back early on in the season how to get your coon shrimp ready for summer steelhead. Guess what, they've been in the fridge since then. Actually, that was 727, uh, this this jar is 727.16, believe it or not. I didn't get my recent jar, so um, these will last in my fridge for a couple years if I don't fish them. That's the other benefit to carrying them yourself. Let's talk a little bit about how to put the coon shrimp on the hook. So we have basically here a nice firm cured up coon shrimp. It's in red, smells like anise or anise because that is what they prefer. Uh, I'm looking at the, the head is towards me, the carapace is towards me, body behind it. I have this size one aught hook. I'm gonna simply go through the meat part of the body, curl that up and through just at the back of the head or the carapace area and we're gonna push that on through, okay? And that just lays flat like that. The stinger hook is out front. <clears throat> when this is done, it's right there at the tip of the head. So those short strikes that really focus on the head of that shrimp, that, that hook doesn't need to be that far down from the main bait hook. And uh, it's in the zone of where it's gonna grab those fish just fine. So let's finish this out and I'll show you the reason for the straw. We simply put a single half hitch over the tail and we bring that all the way up to just behind the eye of the hook now we're going to straighten this tail out a little bit i'm going to slide that straw down you guys have seen me demonstrate this before and we just align all those uh, feet or legs along the tail and we twist that straw pull the leader tight we just twist that straw until it goes down on the tail and guess what it straightens that shrimp out okay very nicely now on this particular lure, I got a couple beads that stack on there that helps hold the body of the squid just out over the top end of that. And if you look at how that lays, that's gonna fish in the water with that spinner blade out in front of it, attractability, flash, pink, moving back and forth on your dodger, coon shrimp secured in place, don't even notice the straws there, and that fish is very well. And I'll tell you right now, that is a sockeye killer if I find that they don't want to go after that size of lure, then we just back that down. And uh, in the morning, we'll start off with three or four rods, and we'll put on three or four different lure size presentations. If they want this small stuff, we will switch uh, all four rods to the smaller presentation until they stop biting it. Then maybe we'll go to a larger profile. Again, it's a progression. I let the fish tell me what they want. But the key here is put that clear straw on as you build your lures. When you put that down over that tail, it straightens that out. You put a single half hitch on that tail. It doesn't tear the meat apart, doesn't tear the shrimp apart. They hold on really well and they fish very, very well. Let's talk a little bit about adding flash to your presentation when it comes to sockeye. These are silver hoard dodgers. Um, I like to create a lot of ruckus, noise, and flash. I will put on extra UV tape in different patterns to capture sunlight and light penetrating the water. I put it on both sides to create extra flash and extra uh, attractability. Something else you can do is you take a couple of these dodgers uh, simply by hooking them together um, in a succession, believe it or not, and drag those off of your downrigger ball, you'd be amazed at how well that works. I'm not saying you connect your line to this in any way. You have your clip that goes to your uh, off your downrigger ball to your line, but also off your downrigger. If you're not running any type of flasher or attractability, you need to drag some types of flashers that oscillate and create a whole lot of noise and ruckus and uh, flash. You'll find if you have decent electronics, you can actually watch this sockeye uh, close up proximity to your boat on your electronics, you'll just see the sockeye swimming along with the extra flash underneath your boat. And you're just hoping a few of those will peel back and um, you know find your presentation as you drag it through. Typically on sockeye, you don't have to have very far setbacks unless a lot of boats, have, boats on the water have pushed them back uh, or pushed them deeper. And you're finding that close proximity to your boat, you're not getting many strikes. You wanna go ahead and set those back 30 or 40 feet or even further. But in the most part, create that flash near your boat, keep your presentation close, okay? That's kind of the deal on sockeye. I, I run a handful of lures, lots of pinks, different sizes, put on different sizes in the morning, let the fish tell you what they want. I'm telling you, tie that straw into your lure or presentation. It's going to, uh, you're going to be very happy with how that fish is once you put your coon shrimp on there. Let's talk a little bit about summer steelhead. 
and you know, running basically a seven and a half foot uh, plug rod. I got a, uh, a line counter reel on here so that as I'm putting out my presentation out in front of the drift boat, I can tell exactly how far I'm getting them out there. Extreme low conditions, gin clear water right now. I will run these things 50 feet out in front of the boat. I don't want any additional noise or disturbance coming from the boat prior to the presentation getting to the fish. So I run them a long ways out. I spool those up with braid, top shot of, uh, Top shot of monofilament on there, uh, top six or eight feet is just fine. Some folks are anti-braid on their diver rods. They think the line floats too much. I'm more uh, to be on the camp of it's very small diameter, cuts through the water. It doesn't float enough to be a problem. I don't want the extra stretch and line belly in my monofilament, so I go with braid with a top shot. Run that to uh, small. This is a Brad's medium diver. It's going to go down about uh, 8 to 10 feet, which is ideal. Uh, you can fish this in four foot of water. It'll bounce off the rocks. It does just fine. No big deal. I run that with a snap on top, but on the bottom, we're going to run a barrel or a chain swivel. Okay. The reason for that is as this bill digs in the ground and that edge gets a little sharp and beat up, you'll see that if I have a short barrel swivel or anything shorter on there that pulls that line in tight. When this does encounter that edge, you're going to be cutting through your line. So put your protection on there. That is a chain swivel and that simply keeps that bill from rubbing your line and it, it works fantastic. So you definitely want to do that. You're going to run that to about a five foot leader, five, five and a half. And this is a real simple rig that I run with my coon shrimp on this. This is nothing more than a couple six millimeter, five millimeter, uh, UV beads. Of course, I have the straw on there. Why wouldn't I? I have a, a double hook set as I always run a stinger hook with those coon shrimp. This is a size one aught uh, bait hook in a size four as my stinger hook. And as before, we're simply going to take the coon shrimp and with the top hook, that's your main bait hook. We're going to put it through the body again through the carapace. If I can keep it straight here and not mess this up. Okay through the body, through the carapace, front hook comes down, hangs in front. Again, I'm not going to tear this shrimp up by wrapping it a whole bunch. We're going to put a single half inch on it. That goes right up, right up behind the eye of the hook. Okay. Now we straighten that tail out and get this little straw to come down. Pretty easy to do. All right. We gather the tail together because it's paddled and you just slowly twist that on. Okay. Going to twist that on. It straightens that tail out real nice. And there you go. Now for this one, I'm running just a simple little smile blade again. And when this is all collected together, it looks just like that. That thing is going to swim fantastic. It's downriver of your diver. It just basically moves back and forth with the diver. You got your stinger hook out in front. And uh, for those short strikes, Something about summer steelhead, they see those eyes of that coon shrimp coming at them. You got good scent, good color, good durability because you've cured them following the recipe that I've shown you for years. Stack a couple beads on there. Make sure your smile blade is spinning freely. Put that straw on there. It's going to work very well uh, in keeping that shrimp performing straight. Uh, you can fish them naked too without any beads or anything, which I do often in low clear water. That's all they get. They get a coon shrimp with a single half hitch and a clear straw over the tail and it works fantastic. Those summer steelhead in gin clear water um, in low conditions are going to grab that time and time again, especially in light areas or, you know, light pressured areas. Those fish are going to respond to that very well. I have a float rig rigged up over here. It's no different. Uh, I'm fishing a clear float because of how clear the water is. Uh, again, for summer fishing, I like to put a bobber stop above and a bobber stop below. Now I can take the bobber stop all the way down to my weight and I can fish this as a traveling slip float or I can go ahead and slide the bottom stop up, bring the top stop down. I can pin that float on my line to fish a specific depth as I approach a hole and know exactly how deep I want to fish. I have an inline Bomac little weight, little quarter ouncer. Half ounce float, quarter ounce weight is going to work really well. I'm fishing about a 20 inch liter. And guess what? I have a double hook set up once again, simply a size one bait hook and a size four stinger. Yep. I got the straw on there and this one's kind of interesting. It's easy to do this uh, with this particular rig and I'll do it real quick here. 
we just simply uh, keep it light and clean, not a lot of things on there, you don't need them. You're basically fishing this thing vertically down, even though you pin it the same exact way, the way it hangs in the water column. So we're gonna put a half hitch on that, just like before, no different than on the sockeye rig, no different than on your bait diver rig, and you're gonna twist that straw down on there. Now all I do to keep that straw in place, in line there, a simple little easy egg or a soft plastic egg that I can slide down that kind of bites on the line. And that just basically ensures that my straw is gonna stay down on top of that tail and not float up. This thing is hanging under the float in the water just like that. It's going to fish um, out in front of you through the drift under a bobber and it's gonna go through the water column just like that. And the fish absolutely hammer these things hanging vertically. It doesn't have to present like a jig. There's no reason for that. Believe it or not, a dead shrimp with good color, good scent hanging vertically in the water column is something that captures steelhead's attention. And that's yet just another way to rig your coon shrimp and approach uh, with a different technique. So right there, I just showed you three different ways to rig, all similarly the same in that I use about a one inch piece of clear plastic straw, brought to you by my dad, by the way, years ago when we first started fishing coon shrimp. And uh, whether I'm using them for sockeye, using them for some run steelhead on a bait diver, or fishing them vertically under a float, that is exactly how I rig. So give that a try. Let us know here at FHN if you do so, if you find success. I've had guys over the years tell me that the straw is the absolute ticket. They've been using it for years and they'll never go back. So if you're not, using it and you're still multi half hitching your tails and they're tearing off and you're not fishing your shrimp or they're not staying straight for you and you have frustration give that a try you're going to find that it probably works pretty well okay we're going to jump out for a quick break we come back we are going to be for some their favorite uh segment of the week we'll be in the kitchen with chef kelly and sherry for a fantastic recipe of the week so don't go anywhere stay tuned we'll be back right here on fhn Hey everyone, welcome back to Fish Hunt Northwest. We're here in the kitchen again this week for the recipe of the week. And we have, I don't even know what it is. It's moose. Moose. Yes. How'd you look upon that? Well, we have, we have friends. 
We have friends. <laughs> Amazingly enough, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have friends that gave us a piece of moose round, and I thought this would be a great opportunity to uh, show off sous vide. Sous vide. Yes, sous that's vide. That's the facial that I'm getting yes, here. Yes, that's the yes. facial you're getting. Yes. So this is a sous vide machine here. This is a uh, Juul. Uh, this is an app-based one, and there's other ones that have physical buttons, which I kind of, you know, for me, I would probably have gone with that route. But the, the cool thing about this one is that it uh, has an app that will tell you the temperatures, so it will, you know, oh, that's the way I want my steak to look. Mm -hmm. And just push it, and it automatically goes for the time and temp for that for that one. But if you're out in the great outdoors and you yeah, don't yeah. have Wi-Fi, yes. then you need the other one. Yeah, because yeah. this needs Wi-Fi and needs Bluetooth. Okay. So, so you know, yeah. all those things. So, you know, okay. make your decision on what's good for you. So the basic premise okay. is, is that this thing will bring it up to temperature. Uh, and we ran this up to 129 degrees, which we're shooting for like a rare, medium rare. Uh, of course, with your uh, uh, wild game, you want to kind of keep it in the uh, in the rare that that kind of te uh, temperatures because if you cook it more well done it's gonna be dry it's gonna be even sous vide can't it can't help you on that one um, so okay, yeah so you boiled the water and got it to temperature yeah so then, yeah, I, I I help this out yes this machine will bring it up to temperature okay but I add a little bit of boiling water to kind of help it up and get it get it there faster. Because, okay. you know, it, it is, it is, you know, it could take two hours for this volume of water. So the basic premise is, is that you're going to season your meat. Uh, I put uh, salt, pepper, garlic powder, rosemary on here and then vacuum sealed it. And then it cooks in this water. Instead so, of just throwing the meat in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> different technique, different show. Uh, oh boy. Yeah, so so then it's just going to cook, and then it can cook. You know, this was five hours, but the, the basic premise is if, if, if it's at a low temperature like that, it won't overcook. So, uh, I mean, eventually, yes, it can overcook, mm -hmm. but it, it uh, you know, you can go 24 hours with this. You know, so if you had to go to work, you know, hey, on the off chance, in the off chance, yes, <laughs> and uh, you know, and uh, just don't worry about it. Okay. Okay. So today we're going to be doing the sous vide mousse, and then we have polenta with asparagus and a red wine horseradish cream sauce. Okay. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to sear this. Obviously, you see that I have put on some paper towels to kind of soak up some of the because when you take it out, it's going to be a little bit wet. So just kind of dry okay. it off, pat it dry, and there mm -hmm. you go. Got pan ready to Get go. Pan ready, ripping hot, because we're just gonna sear this. This thing is cooked. It's ready to go. It's cooked. And so it's cooked all the way through. Yes, it's cooked all the way through. Well, not all the way through, but cooked to the temperature that you want it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Got some asparagus in the back. Let that get seared. Oh, and you, you already blanched the asparagus, right? Yeah. And you do that just because asparagus is hard to get exactly right if you're just um, like throwing it in the pan. It takes a little bit longer and... Yeah, so because, yeah. uh, you know, if you, uh, if you throw it in here, you're gonna have it's like kind of raw in the center. And mm -hmm. then, and you're gonna be fighting it. So we're gonna season up our asparagus a little bit here. Okay. We mm. got some garlic going. Yep. Okay. Like that. Some butter. A little bit of butter, a little bit of garlic. Perfect. So you just hold it up on each side. Yeah, because you know this one had kind of like a three sides going on thing. Mm -hmm. I can help you out if you wanted. Uh -uh. <laughs> You've I'm, got this. I've done this a couple of times. Yeah, one man show. So yeah, we got our crust now, and we're good to go. You're already ready to plate. Yes. Wow. I'm ready, ready to plate. I pass me my. Well, you have to cut. And the... if you don't know about polenta, <laughs> I did about uh, three and a half cups of water to one part 
of uh, polenta and just let it cook for about 20 minutes. Okay. Let's taste your meat. supposed to eat your veggies today, okay? Yes, I will. Okay, so we're just going to slice. So that's like the same color throughout the whole thing. Yeah, and I'll show you here in a second here. Okay. So I'm not quite left-handed. So as you can see, edge to edge, and for wild game, that is just stunningly gorgeous. Unbelievable. Right? Looks so tasty. And I have not eaten moose. You have not? Nope. Well, everybody's eating moose. It's common, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh, sure. So what's this sauce? So this is a uh, red wine horseradish cream sauce. Mm. Mm. Try not to cover up our... Beautiful mousse, maybe just a little bit on top. Just a little? Yeah. Wow. I mean, come on. There you go, guys. Easy stuff. You can see wow. how beautiful that is and easy it is. I mean, I, I cooked it in the, uh, in the sous vide machine, mm -hmm. seared it, boom, done. Dinner is ready. Yeah. Awesome. And whenever you want it to, you know, it's like, oh, hey, we're kind of dragging, guests are trying to catch up. Uh huh. Easy. Sous vide just is. Just go ahead and cut it for when they show up. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Well, while we dig in, we're going to go ahead and throw it back to the guys in the studio. Yay. Welcome back in studio. Found my way back in here. Oh, Didn't boy. have too far to walk. No. Yeah. You look tired. I'm tired. It's been hard, a long week. Hard day of concrete? Yeah, it's just been a long week. Well, you know what they say about concrete, it's hard. It's I mean, eventually. Definitely right. hard. Yeah, I got it. Uh, yeah, this is a, uh, this is a, at times, a daunting task to do, uh, get this all put together in a yep. timely fashion and present all this, but we wouldn't have it any other way. We enjoy bringing this info out each and every mm -hmm. week. I'm so glad so many folks are tuning in and supporting us. Barnum, we got a couple hats sitting here on the desk we probably okay. need to give away. Yeah. So uh, we got about a little over a half hour left in the show. We want you to take opportunity, those that are tuning in, all of you, and uh, share out our live feed. Start now, share this out. The person that shares this live feed out with the most people this evening and gets those folks to like our page and tell who sent them. So if you reach out to folks and share this and they come back and say so-and-so, uh, shared me this info. The person that gets the most uh, responses, their name mentioned the most times, is going to win a hat of your choice. We got the uh, blue and blue, and we got the green and black backing trucker style hat with the, uh, with the fish on Northwest patch. And uh, lots of folks are jumping on these. We have a number of them still left. We're selling them for only 22 bucks. That's a screaming deal, That's a good deal for the first hats out the door. We want to get our, our branding out there. So thankful for many of you who are wearing it currently and ordering shirts. Shing was busy all day filling orders. It was kind of cool. Uh, lots of hoodies, lots of sweatshirts, lots of t-shirts of various colors and all sizes. And of course, we got the hats, stickers I pick up tomorrow. Those are going to go out the door like crazy. Lots of folks asking for stickers. So starting to compile our swag and we want to share it with you all. So make sure you jump on, share this live feed tonight as uh, we know that that works and get folks to start responding to what we got going on. We're going to prize you up with a hat. Might even throw a shirt in if you get enough folks. We'll, we'll see how that goes. But hey, what's going on in the realm of weather? Anything? Yeah, let's check it out. <laughs> yeah, Always. maybe we'll get up there and take a look. Let's check a look here. We got a weekend coming up in a couple days. Can I get out on the ocean? What's going on? Uh, yeah, so here's what's going on. Here's kind of a quick breakdown of Westport as far as your dailies go on AccuWeather here. Uh, tomorrow you're looking at 67, cloudy. 69 Saturday, mostly sunny. 68 Sunday, partly sunny. So that doesn't look all that bad. Uh, as I click over here, let's kind of take a tides at Westport, see what the tides are doing. 
Uh, let's just flip here to Saturday. You got a low at 9.44 a.m. and a high that's gonna be about 4.36 p.m. So, you know, not, not a horrible time of day tide uh, other than the fact that they are minuses. And when we have the minuses, we tend to get this. Uh, Saturday, we're looking at northwest winds, five to 15 knots, wind waves one to two feet, west swell five feet at nine seconds. Oh. So we're coming off a week with just absolutely amazing ocean conditions. Right. I mean, I've seen pictures, you know, we were out there on Sunday and it was just beautiful. The swell might've been two feet at 20 seconds. Right. Uh, we're gonna build up a little bit this weekend. But it looks like as we roll into the first part of next weekend, things will start to lay back down as those tides start to decrease a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have some rain in the week, and as I click here, and we just pulled up the Wainuchi River so you guys could see that, uh, you know, we did have that bump of rain on Wednesday. Yep. Here you see it, a little rise in the river, and it's gonna start falling back down for this weekend, and, and kind of just, you know, as the month goes on, looks like it's gonna go back to its trend line. Kind of be right there at that 150. Right. Which is extremely low, and that that's right. just, uh, kind of replicates all the rivers out in this region and what's going on. I mean, it is summer steelhead season and uh, water is low, you know, the cowlitz is low and, and a lot of the rivers are low and that's just what it is. Uh, right. Even though it seems like we've had an extremely wet um, uh, July for yeah. the most part. This hot, dry, dusty summer that uh, they had predicted and warned us about has not truly come in yet. So yeah, the worst it, part so far about I mean the wet conditions great. You know, less fire danger. Yeah, cooler temperatures great for working except for the humidity. The humidity oh sucks. Oh my god. Yeah, that's pretty brutal. <laughs> um, Dave and I were talking before the show, and he was asking about river levels and how that affects returning fall salmon. And uh, I reminded him last year. You know, I always kind of look at that first week in September to kind of gauge how our early fall fisheries relative to river conditions are going to perform. You and I were trying to hunt elk last year, yeah. first week, and uh, it was raining like a bastard. Yep. We had rain coming down like crazy. Yep. Sucks for elk hunting, great for salmon fishing. Right, right? That's, so that's pretty typical for that stretch of September. Right. You usually right. get one good, like the first good rain of the fall, you yep. know, but this yep. year, I mean, who knows? <laughs> We might do this all the way through fall. Or we may get that hot, dry summer, but it may show up here like last week of July and last all the way through September. Right. So right. I guess we'll right. wait and see. Hey, before we jump out for a break, I want to remind you all, get access to some of the best private waterfowl hunting fields in Washington State. Nowhere to hunt. Has access to prime fields in Skagit County and has just added properties in Grays Harbor and Eastern Washington as well. They have two memberships type, a flat rate membership for unlimited hunting. They're taking $100 off of that through the month of July. Uh, definitely want to check that out. And or you can buy the other type of package, a couple hundred bucks, gonna get you five to seven times of access to all their fields throughout the entire season. You pick your dates, you buy that uh, partial membership. I think you'll be happy with your opportunity. Avoid the 15 shell limit. Uh, long lines and overhunted fields associated with the public hunts and an affordable price. Learn tried and true hunting techniques from seasoned guides and members. Know where to hunt is where quality hunters can access quality waterfowl. Go to the website knowwheretohunt.com to join and get more information. Jeff and Rick do a fantastic job. We're intrigued by the Grays Harbor opportunity. Going to yep. be giving you boys a call and hook something up for FHN. Plan to go out there and well, you're just going to waste a bunch of shells. I'm going to kill right. some birds. Right. So. I've got a couple messages about this. You know, is it worth it? Yeah. You know, check out the website. Yep. Get a hold of these guys. Talk to them. Feel them out. I yep. think you'll find out there are a couple of class act guys, yep. and they're going to take care of you. So, well, I mean, if you're frustrated with crowded bl public blinds, right. you know, w public hunting is great. But our population has exploded in Washington State. We got a lot of folks that like to get outdoors and recreate. It is not always easy, even midweek on some of our hunts, even our goose days on Wednesdays, you can't get into an area to right. go hunt. Right. First of all, we got a lot of areas getting locked up by companies like what Nowhere to Hunt is doing, which is great on one side that you can often you know, go ahead and take advantage of, but you're gonna be frustrated with your public limited access or overcrowded opportunity and you finally just go i'm done i'm done waterfowl right. hunting so right so the alternative to that is to go out and try to find private access yep and that's getting harder and harder to find yes. number one because a lot of those fields are leased up and number two 
a lot of people are sick of how some people treat their property. Absolutely. So that's I mean, usually yeah. the biggest. This uh, could be a great way to have a really good, comfortable day of hunting. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So give those guys a look. Nowhere to hunt, nowhere to hunt.com. Give them a call. We're going to jump out for a break. We come back. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit of summer steelhead, Barnum, yep. low river conditions, yep. and some things you need to understand to go be successful. We're going to talk with Todd Daniels, Tall Tales Guide Service, on the Cowlitz River. Believe it or not, in some respects, almost overperforming in what right. what it was anticipated to do, which, you know, we don't have to get into what they've done to that run and how that hatchery program is, in my, in my uh, mind, in the toilet. But we'll kind of pick Todd's brain, get some great insight on how you can get out there and be successful on the Cowlitz River for summer steelhead. We come back right here on FHM. Hey, welcome back to FHN. Thanks for hanging with us. With with us. Wiggas. Jeez. Wiggy, wiggy, wiggy. Uh, <laughs> thanks for hanging with us through the commercial break. Some folks were asking what this is. And, uh, well, that's how we do it here at FHN. We work with our advertisers and sponsors. Take a little commercial break. Allows us to reset, take a yep. swig of beer, and get amped up for the next uh, segment that we're going to bring to you. And that just happens to be talking some summer steelhead. When's the last time you summer steelhead fished, Marm? Long time. Yeah. It's been a long yeah. time. I have, uh, I have some time coming up. 
and not only going to be fishing the salt water, but I am really itching to get back out and start drowning some of those coon shrimp in my drift boat, and more than likely will next week. Dad, get ready. I think we're heading south. But awesome. uh, based on this information coming out of our good buddy Todd Daniels, Tall Tales Guide Service, we're going to talk a little bit about Cowlitz Summer on Steelhead. That used to be one of the go to plan on it every summer, go down there, spend a couple days, get tons of fish, fantastic time, tons of boats up and down the river. Not so the case as of the latter years going on, but Todd down there grinding it out. Uh, Mr. Daniels, uh, owner of Tall Tales Guide Service, how's it going, buddy? Nice to have you on the show. Good evening, guys. How are you? We're doing great. We're doing great. We are uh, working our way through the madness that we you know, subject ourselves to week in and week out. So <laughs> and, and create, might I add? Yeah. Yes, yeah. So anyway, buddy, uh, I haven't had you on the old airwaves for a couple of years simply because off doing other things. But um, you are down there grinding it out on the callets, which you know, there's a handful of guides that still tried and true stick it out. You've had that river dialed for years. How's it? Uh, you know, how how do you gauge it? How's it performing this year? Early season, you've been down there for what, a little over a week or so. How's it going? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, like you were saying earlier, uh, I'm I'm pleasantly surprised. Yeah. Um, there's there's more fish in there, I believe, than people are uh, giving it credit for. You know, coming into the season, what have you. Um, you know, so yeah, <laughs> you know, I guess this day and age, we can say, you know lower your expectations a little bit so to speak pretty much straight across the board however that being said there there is fish in there um there's ample opportunity and if you fish in the right spots all the spots that uh, we have traditionally caught fish in, you have caught fish in for you know your entire life they're there they're there right now um and you know uh how summer steelhead are um once you hook them the first thing they do is they go about airborne about five feet out of the water <laughs> right. and it's no, uh, it's it's addicting. It's ridiculous. So, um, no, it's fun. Um, yeah, whatever you do, wink, wink. Do not bring your coon shrimp down there. They don't work. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that would be a big mistake. Don't bring those yeah, down. You're, big, you're just yeah, killing please, smolt. Yeah. Yeah. Please deliver your coon shrimp to my address. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can do that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so ahead. let's talk a little. Uh, let's talk a little technique. I, uh, you know, being a drift boat guy, as far as yep. the you know handful of boats I have, I've never wanted to get into a sled. If I'm going to be on a river, I'm just one of those guys that enjoys drift boat. I don't mind rowing all day, running those bait divers, putting those coon shrimp in front of their face, stuffing it in their pie hole, as I like to say. Um, you're out there running a sled. Basically, you know, the college years back, synonymous for lots of side drifting. Everybody get on the on the conveyor belt and just go up and down that river side drifting. What's your approach this season and how's it working? That's correct. Well, you know what's happened over the last couple of years, you know, pretty much straight across the board, is this bobber dogging has taken over. Um, you know, bobber dogging eggs, uh, bobber dogging coon shrimp or whatever your favorite, you know, concoction is to target your summer steelhead as opposed to the side drifting is. Man, it's just freaking awesome. You just don't lose gear. Um, you can cast out and hold a, a particular line down the river or in a, in a, in a trough or a mm -hmm. channel and what have you, and it just flat out works. Now, that being said, you know, the callus, it's low, man. We're running at, uh, what, about 2,400 CFS right now, so it's low. You can, and the water's low and clear. You can see the buckets. You can see the green lines. The key is down here, if you want to catch a fish, is A, don't drive over them. If you drive over them, forget about it. Um, they're they're going to turn off the bite and scatter. Um, keep your boat away and cap into the uh, green bucket if you're going to be bobber dogging or side drifting or what have you. Um, and, uh, you know, more times than not, they're going to be there. They're going to be in specific locations, in those deep troughs and those holes and things like that. It's awesome. Now, if you get tired of doing that, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of drift boat guys down there and certainly the, the sled guys too, uh, you know, flip the boat around and put your diver and bait out and, and back those cooners down the same trough. And, uh, you know, you know how those rod takedowns go on those, right. man. Holy cow. Yeah, extremely That's, aggressive uh, and exciting. So much yeah. Fun. So much fun. Well, you're saying you know, the river so levels are pretty low. Did you guys see any bump at all from the – the rain that we've had this week and then the previous week? No, not really. Cause okay. that's all, it's damn control. Yeah. Right. You know, um, what will happen is, uh, uh, you know, after a good rain or whatnot, um, you know, things like blue Creek and some little, you know, creeks that are dumping in throughout there, it'll put a little bit of color in the river, right. which, right. uh, absolutely helps. 
you know, um, you know, a couple of days ago, it was a night. It, it couldn't have been more of a perfect, you know, green four foot of visibility. It was, it was money. Mm-hmm. And, uh, there, there are definitely some nets flying for sure. But, uh, you know, by and large, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty much unlimited visibility. Yeah. And the cool thing is, you know, at least in jet sled, I do. I don't know. I'm a nerd or whatever. <laughs> I like to stand up on the transom of my boat in those sunny days and you can look down, you can see the fish in the hole. Yeah. Um, you know, you'll see, you know, sometimes you'll see two, three, five, ten fish just milling around down there. And what that does is it reaffirms, you know, where you're fishing, where you're casting. So the next day you go out there, first thing in the morning or what have you, uh, you know there's fish in that exact spot the previous day. Keep your boat off of those areas mm-hmm. and, and cast in there. Right. And, you know, just knowing that the fish are in there. And you know, more days than not, you'll get at least one out of each hole. Pretty cool. You're, uh, you're for the most part, as you mentioned, you're bobber dogging and you've converted over. And I know you do that up on uh, the Skycomish as well. I mean, you kind of flip back and forth, whether you're yep. targeting uh, Chinook and or summer steelhead, the side drifting slash bobber dog, and it all works. Uh, you're putting your yes, clients on the floats and bobber dogging for all the reasons uh, mentioned. Are a majority of guys down there still side drifting? What's the, what's the majority of the program running no, down there? No, like I said, a couple of years ago, I, you know, up till about a couple of years ago, uh, 90% of everybody down there side drifted. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it was just, you know, bring 100 liters with you and hold yeah. on, here we go, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, pretty much. You know, and and it, it's pretty much a, it's flip-flop now. It, there's maybe 10% of the guys yeah. down there uh, are side drifting now, 90% are bog-dogging. Wow. I mean, shoot, you go from losing, you know, it depends on how many people are in your boat, you know, 50 liters a day, uh, you know, down to, you know, 8 or 10 at yeah. the most. Yeah. So it's just, and you, you do that and you catch more fish. I mean, right. it's a no brainer, right? Yep. So, what, uh, yeah, how the size awesome. of these fish this year? They healthy? They do a typical oh, six yeah, pound yeah, or? They're, yep. Uh, they're nice, healthy, you know, you know, seven, 10 pounds. You know, there's some fish on, you know, higher than that too. So, you know, some nice, nice 11, 12 pound, uh, summer steelhead that, yeah. uh, my God, you know, I, cause that water throughout the, the year, um, as the summer goes on and warms up, it still stays cool because it comes out of the bottom of, of the dam. Yeah. Right? Right. So those fish just stay hot, man. Right. You're just about the net one that you, I swear they make eye contact with you and they go, <laughs> nope. And they just rip out, you know, it, it, it's awesome. I think I looked it's last awesome. week and it was about 2,400 or so. What's it flowing? Did you check the last couple yep. of days? I didn't look. Yeah. Yeah. It's at 24. It's been, been pretty consistent, right? At about 2,400. Yeah. Now there's rumors about them trying to lower it down to about 2,000. Holy cow. Happened. And, uh, you know, that basin is not <laughs> yeah. really designed for navigation um, at that river level. So, you know, there's, there's plenty of water in it. But, you know, if you're going to take your sled or even your drift boat down there, you know, pay attention, man. There's, mm-hmm. there's some rocks that uh, haven't been exposed for a long time that, you you know, they can do a lot of damage in a you, hurry. You got to know the river definitely when it gets that low. Some of those tight corners and stuff get just that. They become extremely tight. You have one slot that you can find your way through. Even as a drift boat guy coming down, you still got to pick your line and make sure you're not going to, you know, get it up on a rock or uh, get it sideways against something that's not going to move. Um, I know for certain, based on conversations with a few folks, that, you know, even past years when I was fishing down there all the time, running trips and doing coon shrimp drill, uh, the fly fishermen are out there in a pretty large percentage now as far as, you know, number of uh, men and women on the water pontoons or drift boats or whatever it is, even sleds are dropping them off on these long gravel bars that the, uh, that the Calitz is known for. But I've also been told that in, nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's plenty of great fly fishing water down there. Guys are down there catching cutthroat and trout and, and steelhead, hopefully. Um, there becomes an issue as we have to share the water. Right. We have to share the water. And some of these guys want to fish certain yes. tighter slots. I mean, when I look at a river and break it down, I'm looking at, you know, how the river lays out. I want to I want to focus on those pinch points as a bank <laughs> angler. I'm looking at where I have to cover the least amount of water that those fish are going to have to travel through. It only makes sense. So I'm looking at pinch points. These guys and gals, they might be fishing that stretch of water. You're operating a 22, 24 foot sled. You have a small margin of error that you uh, are willing to endure um, to get through a certain spot. I've heard there's been a few, you know, not so happy folks out there simply because the sleds and the drift boats have to navigate through the water. 
I don't have an answer for these people. Maybe you can shed some light on how that's going or have you encountered any issues <laughs> or you want to warn people about what's going on? Yeah, I mean, yeah, issues is a strong word, but, uh, you know, I mean, the cool <laughs> thing is there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of fly fishermen down there now and it's growing in popularity. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I get it. It's awesome. Yeah. It's, you know, there, there's dads bringing young kids down there, teach them how to fly fish and and it's great. And, you know, maybe some days they'll, they'll get the. Uh, you know, the itch and actually catch one, it'll be pretty cool. But, uh, you know, certainly this time of year, what's happening right. is there, like you said, there's these pinch points and it's, man, it's the Cowles river. It's blue Creek. Right. Anybody that knows anything about steelhead fishing knows it's a busy area. You know, we basically, uh, we all got to get along. Right? Yeah. And like you said, there, there's Share the water. areas where jet slits have to go through, uh, drift boats have to go through because right. it's three inches deep right behind these areas. And if the fly fishermen or or gear fishermen, but uh, you know, primary the fly fishermen are standing right there, you know, it it takes about four seconds tops for a jet sled at thirty miles an hour to rip through there. I'm sorry, uh, that's the only way to go for for safety of everybody and everybody on board. Um, you know, we all got to share and and, and uh, you know you know get along. And, and if we can do that, uh, you know, there's there's hope for us down there and, and hope for everywhere. If we're gonna sit here and uh, you know, get pissed off at each other, you know, the drift boat guys versus the jet sled guys versus the fly fish guys versus the bait guys. Yeah. It's not right. going to work. It's, we're going to all lose. Right, right. Well, you know, in my mind, Todd, there's two different approaches to this. Okay, you're, you're either navigating and traveling the water, or if you're one, as you're operating a boat, you either allow your folks to fish through, or if you're running a drift boat and you're pushing your bait divers right down into his or her water that they've established as a bank angler, no matter if they're fly fishing, gear fishing, doesn't matter, bobber fishing, um, you're in the wrong. You're in a boat, you have all the river to fish, you have no business pushing your presentation through that person's piece of water. That's called a respect thing. It's called sharing the water. That's what we do. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. On the other side of that, if you are a powerboat uh, navigating back up river and you have no choice but to go through this piece of water, right. um, that's the line you're going to choose because it's the safest for you and your clients. If, in fact, your fishing clients or friends, doesn't matter. Um, that's the line you're going to choose. If they think that you have no business running that line while they're trying to fish, then they are mistaken. So I guess it's understanding both sides of the fence, what's appropriate, when you should and can fish from a floating device, when you want to give the bank angler access, and the bank anglers need to understand that there's navigation involved for the safety of all. So that's kind of how you break that down for people that just can't figure it out on their own. That's why we're here. So (laughs) anyway, got any- You said it way better than me. (laughs) Yeah, well, that's what we get paid the big bucks to do. So uh, calm the masses and keep the peace, right? Um, Hey, buddy, you have uh, have any openings uh, for the next few weeks that you're down there until you switch off to something else, or what's your program looking like? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, you know, start here uh, the end of next week. Uh, you know, got got some availabilities here and there coming on down because, you know, these these people had too, man, they they're going to be in here right through August and yeah. September. And the only reason everybody kind of gives up on it is everybody's switching over to salmon. Salmon opportunity, uh, sure. You know, start, yeah, exactly. And I include mm-hmm. myself come middle of August, we're going to start heading down to Columbia and, okay. and uh, start targeting the, the ball chinook. But between now and then, absolutely, if anybody wants to get out and uh, – the target some of these uh, feisty critters absolutely well i know they can track you down at talltalesguideservice.com they can reach you at 206-437-8766 give you a ring yes, book sir. a trip you'll have a nice sunny day as the weather's changing as barnum gave a fantastic weather report prior to getting you on and uh <laughs> good opportunity go. to get out there get a sunburn catch a summer steelhead enjoy the antics and humor of mr one said todd daniels so <laughs> Um, yes, sir. It never ends. Yeah, all right. Always a pleasure, my friend. We'll keep in touch. Pleasure to have you back on the show. Have a great night. Yeah, likewise, guys. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate oh, you bet. You. Take care. All right. Have yeah. Been. If you ever spend a day in that guy's boat, he is an absolute <laughs> ass clown. So, uh, <laughs> hell of a fisherman, though. The guy is dialed, known Todd for years, and uh, does a great job along with a handful of other guides that we speak to. Speaking of which, we'll jump right. out for a quick break. The man, the myth, the legend, the guy that has the Baker Lake sockeye fishery dialed to a gnat's ass, uh, Mr. Cal Stocking, is going to join us here on the phone. If you have plans to go fish Baker Lake in the next few weeks while you still have good opportunity to get some fresh sockeye, get your notepad, record this, follow this, watch it again and again after we get out of here this evening. Cal is bringing you the info you need to know to be successful on Baker Lake for sockeye when we come back right here on FHM.
At Metal Supermarkets, we understand your need for fast access to a wide variety of metals, so we've made it easy. Our network of stores carries a wide variety of metal in all different types, shapes, sizes and grades, with no required minimum order size. Who could ask for more? Simply tell us your dimensions online, on the phone or in store and we'll cut or process the metal to your desired size, often while you wait. We offer same-day service and can deliver the metal right to your door or job site. We even source hard-to-find metals, so no matter what you're looking for, metal supermarkets can provide it for you. And we're conveniently located with brick-and-mortar stores in Seattle and Portland, so you can check out our extensive stock for yourself. Superior customer service is guaranteed quality service from real people who know metal, we are the small quantity metal experts. To place an order, simply call a store to talk to one of our knowledgeable customer service representatives, fill out a quote request online, order off of our e-commerce website, or visit one of our many locations and pick out the metal you want. Whether you're a small or large business, government, homeowner, or hobbyist, we make it easy for you to buy the exact metal and just the amount you need. We've been doing this for over 30 years, so we know how to get it done. Metal Supermarkets, the convenience stores for metal. Visit or call a Metal Supermarket store near you today. Yep. Hey, welcome back to FHN. We are uh, <laughs> grabbing all these snacks right here. Shing does a fantastic job, I'm telling you. We didn't have in-studio guests this evening. Usually we have this big spread of food in the house for those that join us in studio. So if you're out there and would like to join us on the show, man, just let us know and yep. I might give you an invite and you get to sit here and eat healthy, good snacks. We got pickles and olives and oh, yeah. wrapped meat and cheese and crackers and all the good stuff. Yeah. Then we got to uh, get to eat that moose when we go in uh, after the show's all said and done. So with that, we are winding down here, getting close, almost running out of time, but we are going to extend as we always do. Cal Stalking, Cause for Divorce Guide Service, and you can figure that one out for yourselves. Fantastic name, fantastic individual, longtime friend. How you doing, buddy? Good. How are you guys? Yeah, we're great. Thanks for... Uh, uh, picking up the slack this evening and, uh, you know, hanging in there until we get towards the end of the show. I know it's late and you got to get up early, go to work, but, uh, let's talk a little bit about sockeye fishing up there at Baker Lake. Sounds like a plan. Okay. Um, let's talk about conditions starting off. What can folks expect? I know when you and I talked the other day, water's up a little bit as this time of year and with rain and depending on, you know, flows and whatnot, water can be up, wood can be floating. What are you finding up there? No, wasn't much wood this morning. Um, looks like the uh, Forest Service is usually pretty good about picking most of that up. There are some big pieces in there, so okay. guys are running up there in the dark. Need to be real careful. And, uh, just be cautious. Be aware of what's going on. Right. Uh, not as bad as it usually is, but the, the lake's way, way up this year. I don't know that I've ever seen it this high before. Oh, lake. no kidding. Yeah, it's uh, it's in the trees yeah. everywhere you look. So. 
It was like that a couple years ago, which makes it tough if you have a reason to go to the shoreline. If you have something that you need to do or what have you, you're you're going to be kind of in trouble because there is no shoreline once you get up there, there and the water's all the way up to the trees everywhere. Isn't that right? That is correct. Yeah. There's a few spots, but it, uh, it does make it a little bit more difficult. Yeah, yeah. So how's fishing starting off? They uh, I didn't check the um, – last week I took time to go ahead and look into the – fish trap and the numbers that they've transported to the lake. I have not looked for a couple days, Cal. Can you give us an update on how many fish have been transferred? Yeah, total fish to the lake so far is 4,336. Okay. Well, yeah. Those are not bad, but not great. <laughs> um, usually by now, this is about the peak of the run, and if that's the peak, we may be in trouble. But, okay. Uh, everything's been running a little late this year, just with the conditions that we yeah. are. How, how many fish should they have transported at this point on a normal year and with the uh, forecast that they gave us? The forecast this year was 33,767, I think. Okay. And they've downgraded that now to 24,000. Mm. Right. And the commercials have taken, well, we're not sure. We've heard about 10 to 12. Um, again, those numbers are not exact. And then the hatchery is supposed to take 9,000 and we get what's left. Okay. okay. So that was kind of that was kind of broken up there and muffled. So ten to twelve thousand for the tribal fishery in the river. Uh, hatchery is going to take about eight for egg take and escapement needs or hatchery uh, supplementation, and yeah. the rest get transferred up into the lake. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. Um, well, I mean, if we end up at twenty four thousand, and if the tribes are done fishing and they're at that about that fifty percent tile, so. I guess that's kind of where it, where it's at. If the run underperforms and we end up with, you know, fifteen thousand fish, we're going to be in trouble. Yeah, that's so. For sure. So I, <clears throat> I think the hatchery is going to continue to take their fish probably until they get their their total take. Um, I think there were four hundred or so show up yesterday. The day before, I think it was like one hundred forty eight. Um, today, I want to say it was right around four or five hundred. So. They've got to get 2,100 fish this week, and then next week it drops to 900 for the mm. so. Okay. They put those fish uh, out of the Marble Mount uh, fish trap there. They put them up in the lake. How how long, you know, will those fish be in the lake, and they'll still be uh, aggressively biting? In other words, you transfer a fish in that lake. In about a week or so, a couple weeks, they kind of go off the bite, till, you know, and they put fresh fish in, and then you get some more biters. Or What's yeah, your estimation I would on that? Say, Three to four days after they drop them in the lake, they'll start to bite. Okay. This has not been, you know, pretty consistent over the last six or seven years. Right. Um, just depending on, they're dumping probably 50% at the dam and 50% in the upper lake. Right. That uh, seems to be, you know, the last few years. And uh, we fished the upper lake this morning, tried the middle lake, there weren't any fish there. There were about 80, 80, 90 boats up there today, and we caught two. And that was probably, if anybody got three, I would have been shocked. Huh. But, uh, the few people that we talked to that have been up here for a week or more, it's been really, really tough fishing yeah. in the last oh. week. But, granted, okay, we did have a full moon. We've had a lot of low-pressure systems come through, a lot right. of rain. And that has a chance to turn those things off the bike. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> you think that's what's going on, weather conditions and and what we've been up against in that regard and uh, pressure, quite a few boats. Yeah. yeah, a lot of boats, and this weekend should be super busy. I okay. Mean, well, how do you crack coming. the code? You know, I mean, let's talk, uh, before we get out of here this evening, let's talk uh, depth, troll speed. Uh, a lot of times guys troll too fast. These are sockeye. Slow presentation is key. Let's talk uh, colors, flash, bait, scent. Let's lay it all out there for people to kind of dial in their program, go up there, find some success. Yeah, the... Uh We've been fishing pretty big stuff this year to start with. And so full-size dodgers, I haven't caught a fish on a small dodger yet. Mm. So the max dodgers have been working extremely well this year. And the new colors that they have out, of course, your Gold Star, um, any of those larger dodgers. Chrome is the go-to up at Baker Lake. Sure. Uh, any of the stuff in the moon jelly on them works extremely well. Right. And fall at forest colors, pinks and oranges. Um, Seem to be the go-to anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, pink and white's been a great, great color for me. Either with a hoochie or some of the flies the guys are tying now. I've been fishing some of uh, Matt Schindler stuff this year. And oh, been really, really impressed with what he's doing, and uh, it's been very productive for us. 
Well, as far as depths go, um, anywhere between 25 and 40 seems to be where the fish are right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. You marking a lot of fish that just aren't biting, or is there just kind of spotty schools? No. They're not anything hardly schooled up, and that's the other issue. Gotcha. Um, right. The fish are really, really scattered throughout the whole lake. Um, today, both the fish we found were singles, um, just kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. We were going from one side of the lake to the other when we picked up both those fish. So mm, interesting. Not in not in the normal places that we usually catch them. Yeah. So, uh, well, coon shrimp or sand shrimp, what do you prefer? Both. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think 50 50. Yeah. I fish, I fish half my gear with coons and half my uh, stuff with sands. Right. Um, your typical scents, uh, any of your pro crew, pro tier stuff. Uh, the bloody tuna works pretty good up mm -hmm. there. Um, don't be afraid to throw a little garlic in every once in a while. But your shrimp, your krills, your shrimp bananas mm -hmm. uh, can be very, very productive all the way around. Uh, how long will this fishery sustain? I mean, obviously, we're we're going to watch here this week, see if those fish numbers at the fish trap begin to drop off. And if they do, it's kind of an indicator that, oh, bummer, we may be at the tail end of this thing. Or if they kind of hover there for a bit, you know, we go on for a few more weeks. What do you what do you plan on fishing this thing through August? I'll fish all the way through August. And uh, a couple of years ago, when we had very much similar same conditions going, they, uh, we caught, they had a really big push of fish late August clear into September and we're kind of hoping that's what's going to happen this year okay you know the river's been up and down um, quite a bit but like I said the lake the water temperature down by the dam was 60 this afternoon uh, the upper lake was 63 so the water temps are moving up a little bit but usually mm -hmm. by this time of the year we're fishing 70 degree water oh wow so, okay um, I'm glad to see that as long as that lake stays as cool as it is, yeah. the fish will stay in really good condition. Sure. They bite for, yeah. for a long time. Right. Yeah, much like uh, sockeye entering the Brewster Pool. When that temperature goes up, they start getting pretty ugly pretty fast, start getting a little yeah. bit of you know fungus growth on their sides and start kind of deteriorating quickly. So colder water, the better. They stay on the snap, and, uh, boy, they cut red, don't they? Oh, they're beautiful yeah. fish. Yeah, yep. And decent size. Uh, Baker Lake, uh, historically, uh, Barnum, if you didn't know, is uh, typically the biggest sockeye that we're finding in the state with all options uh, out there on the table. So definitely worth the drive up there. Um, you know, you can camp along the shoreline there. If you can find some camping, there's hotels not too far down the road. Makes it pretty convenient. But uh, Or simply, if you don't know how to fish it and want to learn, book a trip with Cal. You got any openings coming up, buddy? I've got maybe one or two. I just had a cancellation today. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty well booked up, but I've got the room to add a couple of more days if we can get some get some more people interested so. cool well we put your number up here on our uh, text line for uh, this evening and folks tuning in and uh, they can track you down at cause for divorce guide service.com find you on facebook obviously and or uh, ring you up at 360-428-5038 that sound about right that's right Awesome. Well, I know you got more fishing to do uh, relative to the sockeye and as the season extends into salmon and whatnot. So don't be a stranger. And uh, if you ever head south, I'm going to have to pull your carcass right on in here in the studio and make you right. sit down and have a talk. So um, look Would forward to that. to do that. Awesome. Thanks for taking the time, buddy. Good to, good to connect. Take care. All right, guys. Take care. Bye. All right. I'm getting that thing out of my ear. Yep. <clears throat> that is about enough of that. We are just a few minutes over. Uh, lots of discussions this evening. Lots of fisheries. We covered Chinook. We, we covered Orcas. We covered uh, Chinook out in Westport, right. Willapaw. We danced around on Baker Lake Saka. We talked somewhere on Steelhead on the Cowlitz. And we even talked a little bit of uh, Upper Columbia River Chinook opportunity and some coho out there in Westport for you. Great. So, uh, bounced around pretty well. Lots of fishing tonight. Lots of, Lots fishing, of fishing tonight. tonight. Lots of hunting last week. Right. It's kind of, well, right. it is kind of our name, Fish Hunt Northwest. <laughs> right. Never know what you're going to get, so you want to tune in every week. Join us every week, Thursday evening, 6 to 9 p.m. right here on Facebook and or our YouTube channel. If you have not done so, please go there and subscribe. Share all our content. Uh, check us out during the week on Facebook. Barnum and I take a lot of time to load up uh, relevant information of ongoings throughout the Northwest. We are uh, going to try to dip a little further down south maybe next week, check out some things Oregon has going on, get a little further east, see what's going on over there in Idaho. Hunting's not too far off, so you should be out shooting your bow and getting ready. 
lots of fishing and hunting prep and ultimately into hunting as we roll through the next several weeks. So um, we're going to jump out of here now for the evening. Thanks for tuning in. Join us next week, 7 p.m. And we're going to get offline here and figure out exactly who we're going to give these hats to. Right. And we'll post that up on our Facebook page. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week right here. Fish on Northwest, 7 p.m. See you then.